Six minutes had passed. Elenuta gave the other women a half-smile. It'll be all right now, her expression said. Shift yourself, Scalp told her. Let me shake your boss's hand. A deal's a deal. Starting now, I'm going to be telling absolutely everyone that this is the only place to come for Horn. Finlay held out the cash in his left hand and extended his right to seal the deal. Scalp took the cash, stuffed it in his jacket pocket and took Finlay by the hand, pulling him sharply forward. The man to his right squatted, grabbing Finlay's ankles and lifting them. Stepping aside, Scalp shoved Finlay towards the railings. His body went up and over, head first. There was a cracking noise, as if a giant nut had been forced open, and at the same time a dull thump. One of the women screamed, and another slapped a more experienced hand over her mouth. Finlay's men ran forward, stopping just short of taking action. It was pretty clear that whatever they did was going to be too late. Scalp stepped into the corridor through the open doorway. Right, gentlemen, we're open for business as usual. You too, he looked at Finlay's men. You can keep your jobs if you can also keep your mouth shut. You might even get a pay rise. Down you go and fetch your former employer. Gloves on, wrap him in clean plastic sheeting. There's some in the boot of my car. We'll get rid of him tonight. Open up his office too. Now we know he keeps his stash here. We'll be able to figure out a little bonus for y'all. Elenuta kept her eyes on the carpet. And ladies, I have a gift for each of you. We'll be visiting Finlay's other flats after this to distribute these more widely, but you get to model them first, so be appreciative. He motioned to one of his men who opened up a backpack he'd had at his feet pulling out several plastic neck collars, each with a small plastic box attached. These little beauties will help you remember your boundaries. We'll be running a length of wire around the apartment. Try to leave when the current's on and you'll get a nasty electric shock, probably a burn. And we'll know exactly what you're up to as it's been modified by a pal of mine to set off an alarm. Like for dogs, one of the women said. Scalp grinned. Exactly. Only, I have a dog, and there's no way I'd put one of these fucking things on him, but then, he's irreplaceable to me. He walked up to the woman, and shoved a hand between her legs. You lot are just walking, money-making pussies. And as I understand it, there's a fresh supply coming in every month through the docks. Finlay had a great setup here, but no idea of how to scale it up. So consider this a hostile fucking takeover. There'll be more of you in each flat soon, so expect to make room. Client hours will be 24 hours a day. Sleep when you can and keep yourselves clean. I don't want any complaints. Elenuta stared at the railings that seemed to have swallowed Finlay. It had been inconceivable an hour ago to think that she might ever miss him. But now... The woman next to her handed a collar along the line. She ran her fingers over its rubbery length and wondered just how bad the pain would be if she crossed the wire. How much electric? she asked. She hadn't meant to. Her strategy had been to stay quiet and keep off Scalp's radar. Her mouth had opened without her permission. Do you want to be the first to find out? Scalp asked. She shook her head. Sensible, as well as pretty. We like that. Sensible means you can be trained. Let me put it like this. There are different settings. The lowest will hurt a bit like a bee sting. The top setting will put you on the floor where you'll piss yourself and wonder why you can't control your limbs as you try to figure out what the nasty burning smell is. Let's see now who's expendable. He looked up and down the row of women before selecting the oldest among them. She had a noticeable slouch, which was understandable given the life she was living. Finley's men called her the hag. Elenuta opened her mouth to protest before the woman next to her dug her sharply in the ribs. Shut up, or it'll be all of us, the woman hissed. Scalp fitted the collar 
around his chosen example's neck, then picked up another unit, fiddling with the settings. Elenuta knew better than to look away. He pressed a button. There was a split-second delay, then a yelp like an animal who'd been kicked with a steel-tipped boot. Scalp smiled and turned the dial. The next time he pressed the button, the yelp was a scream. Elenuta imagined what he'd look like after he'd been hit by a car twenty or maybe thirty times. The image made her feel marginally better. So, does anyone want to join their former boss on the floor down there? He pointed a thumb over his shoulder to the ground floor of the flat. Or shall we agree that this is the start of something very special and that you're all going to do everything I ask without complaint? Silent nods all round. Elenuta looked down at her hands. With no Finlay there, her hands were free from the threat of amputation, even if the rest of her existence had just become even more perilous. Chapter 18 Ava's car greeted the hospital lamppost with a squeal that was her paintwork, crying out in pain as it left the metal. She cursed, stopped, and got out to stare at the damage. It was 6.30 in the morning. She'd set her alarm to make sure she was back at Natasha's bedside before her friend woke up. Hospital visiting hours were irrelevant. She would flash her badge to get in, then explain who she was and that she'd be on duty during the official visiting period. God help the person who tried to deny her entry to the ward. It had been ten o'clock by the time she'd got home last night and by then she wasn't hungry. Aware that she ought to eat, the exact date and time of her last hot meal not readily coming to mind, she'd grabbed a piece of toast, cutting the slightly mouldy crusts from the edge and smearing it with the last of the butter. At some point, she'd have to remember to go shopping. No one stopped her as she walked onto the ward, and as pleased as she was about that, the lack of security was equally maddening. Everything made her angry at the moment. That was the truth. It wasn't going to get any better until she could hold her friend in her arms, knowing that not one single cell of her was being invaded by a malicious, bloody biological army. She paused at Natasha's door to take a breath. Tasha needed her positive and calm. Not over the top, but not morose. She opened the door. A figure sat at the bedside. Ava breathed in sharply. Luke was staring out of the window at the rows of street lighting, holding Natasha's hand as she slept silently. Tears threatened, and Ava bit her bottom lip as he turned his head to look at her. I wasn't expecting you this early, he said. I wasn't expecting you at all, she replied. Flying visit. I caught the 9pm flight out of Charles de Gaulle airport and got here at 11 she woke up a couple of times in the night, and the nurse gave her more pain relief, but the dressing hasn't needed changing. I'd stand up, but I don't want to disturb her. He nodded at his hand, and Ava realized that Natasha's fingers were intertwined with his. She must have been pleased to see you, Ava whispered, pulling up another chair and sitting the opposite side of the bed. Actually, she gave me a bollocking for overreacting. Then she cried for a couple of minutes, so I countered with a bottle of champagne that we'll save for when she's through treatment, and she forgave me. Of course she forgave you. You're the only man she's ever really loved. There's no girlfriend on the scene at the moment? No, she's single. I think that's just as well. Natasha needs to focus on herself, and I'm here to take care of her. You two are useless at keeping your voices down. How the hell did either of you forge successful careers in policing? You'll have woken half the hospital by now. Hey, beautiful, Ava said, standing up and brushing the hair from Natasha's face to kiss her forehead. I found some random bloke at your bedside. They let anyone in here these days. I know. I've been thinking about going straight. He held my hand all night. I've never been with a woman who did that. She tried to sit up winced, and gave in. Do you need a nurse? Eva stood up. 
Sit down and stop panicking, Natasha told her. They cut a bit of me out. It's going to hurt. Luke, when are you coming home? Ava's driving me crazy. She smiled. I'm not sure yet. In fact, I have to get back to the airport already. My flight leaves in a couple of hours. Can you two agree to play nicely until I'm back to referee again? Can you tell her to be less bossy? Natasha asked. Ava, drive the man to the airport, would you? I promise I'll survive the day without you. If you're good, I'll let you give me a really long lecture when you come back this evening. Oh, there's no need, Kalanak said. A taxi will be quicker, and that way Eva can stay here until it's time for her to go to work. No, Eva's taking you. That's an order, and you do not want to mess with me at the moment. He picked up the hand he was still holding and kissed Natasha's fingers. If you need me, I can be here within a few hours, any time. If this were a romantic movie, every single viewer would be in tears right now, Natasha said. But as it's not, I feel entitled to tell you to get your perfectly shaped, unfortunately male butt out of my hospital room and get back to France. I love you, Kalanach told her. I love you too. She sighed and closed her eyes. Idiot. Kalanach laughed kissed her cheek, and left to wait for Ava in the corridor. I won't be long, Ava told her, doing her coat up again. You know I wasn't calling him an idiot, don't you? Are you really going to start this now? Ava asked, sitting gently on the side of the bed. Her friend looked fragile against the backdrop of white sheets and grey walls. Drive him to the airport, walk in with him, Buy him a coffee, then talk to him. Ava, really talk to him. He deserves that much, at least. It's too complicated, Tasha, and it's not the right time. Especially with you, don't you dare. You're my rock, Ava. You're always there for me, and I know how much this is hurting you, but if you use what I'm going through as an excuse to hide behind, I'll never forgive you. You and Luke are adults, even if you're getting pretty good at disguising that fact in your private lives. He's in love with you. Maybe he fucked up big time. Maybe you've done that a couple of times too. Just make a choice. Even if that's only between being a coward and being brave. Are you done? I am, but I'd like a cup of tea. Could you find the nurse before you go and ask her if she'd mind? Natasha smiled. Please? After that lecture, I've got a bloody good mind to say no. Ava stood up. But as you said please... She walked to the door. The thing is, I think the time for Luke and me has passed. I'm pretty sure I've screwed it, whatever it might have been, up. And I'm pretty sure you're in charge of your own destiny, Natasha said. If you want him, tell him. It's that simple. Will you have to organise that tea now? Eva conceded defeat and went to find the nurse. Kalanach took a knee to inspect the damage to Eva's car. The lamppost one, he said. It's safe to drive, though. Thanks for that. Do you want a lift or not? Are you sure you want to take me? Natasha will never know. You can go and get breakfast and just come back later. I promise I won't tell. Kalanach stood, hands in pockets, his dark brown eyes shining in the lamplight. It began to rain droplets catching in his hair and running down his cheeks. He didn't move. Eva felt a rush of regret streak through her with all the fury of lightning. Is there time for us to have breakfast together? She asked. He smiled slowly, gently, the way she always pictured him when she was too tired to distract herself from the truth late at night. He walked around the car to the driver's side, where she stood, his jaw clenching and releasing as he drew nearer. Eva realised she was holding her breath. He opened her door and stepped back to let her in. Thank you, she said. Half an hour later, they were sitting at a table inside Edinburgh Airport, clutching steaming cups of coffee. Thank you for coming, Eva said quietly. 
It would have meant so much to Tasha, waking up and seeing you there. Of course I came. What did you expect? I didn't really think about it. You're in the middle of a case, and it's not cheap to get a flight at the last minute. She added unwanted milk to her coffee for something to do with her fingers. Why didn't you phone me as soon as you found out? He asked. She frowned briefly, then shook her head. I don't know. I suppose I figured there was nothing you could do. I didn't want you feeling that you needed to make some grand gesture like... Well, like this. It's not a gesture. It was as much for my sake as for Natasha's, if I'm honest. Are you sure you weren't more worried that you'd have to see me if I came back? Because you can tell me. I know things aren't great between us after everything that happened. Ava took a sip of her coffee, realized she'd ruined it, and pushed it away. He was right, of course, as was Natasha. Apparently, everyone but her had a pretty good understanding of just how much she was deluding herself and messing everything up. She and Luke had been on the verge of starting a relationship that had been in chrysalis form for a couple of years. Then there had been a night she didn't like to remember. She and Luke had become intimate, physically and emotionally, and at a make-or-break point she'd found an item he'd taken from her. Stolen, she corrected herself. He'd removed it from her house without her knowledge or consent while she was being held hostage by a psychopath and secreted it away as some bizarre trophy. He'd done his best to explain it, but by then the damage had been done and Ava had decided that whatever future they might have had was dead in the water. It meant she wasn't going to get hurt longer term, and that was good. Better speedy disappointment than a broken heart that might take years to mend. Only now, she'd slept with someone else to try and get Luke out of her head, and she hated herself for it. She'd sent Luke away, when what she'd really needed to do was face her own fears. Detective Chief Inspector by day, hormonal teenager by night. It was time to grow up and take a risk. Natasha was right. Luke, I'm sorry, she said. We should have had this conversation a long time ago, but I was so... Don't, he said, putting a warm hand over both of hers. You don't have to. Sending me back to France as Interpol liaison was the right thing to have done. I've faced my demons there, and I've had time to get what happened between us in perspective. It wasn't easy, but I think you did the right thing for both of us. I'd missed France at a much deeper level than I was admitting. We should never have let ourselves get carried away. There's a difference in rank to consider. We'd have had to lie to everyone on the squad, and sooner or later it would have caused problems. I wish things had happened almost any other way than they did, but now we can be friends like we were before. I'm hoping you can forgive me, and that we can start again. I hadn't realized how much your friendship meant to me until I lost it. I'm sorry for taking you for granted. Ava constructed the mask of a smile on her face. Friends. He'd missed France. Sooner or later it would have caused problems, difference in rank. Friendship. She felt the single sip of coffee she'd taken rise, sour in her throat. That's exactly what I was going to say, she said. The words came out, high-pitched and strangled. It was all just a misunderstanding. I overreacted. No, you didn't. But maybe it all happened for a reason. Yeah, I think you're right. And Natasha will be so glad we've sorted all this out. She uncovered a bare wrist. God, I'm not wearing my watch. It's probably time I got going anyway. Um, so, email me an update about Malcolm Riley as soon as, yeah? I will, he said, getting to his feet. We've got some leads to follow up when I touch down later this morning. You haven't slept, she said, sticking her hands into her jacket pockets and making fists. 
That's what the plane journey is for, he said. No news on your other missing person? Nothing yet. And three more dead bodies. I'm off to see the forensic anthropologist now. It's a joint meeting with the deputy pathologist. Never rains but it pours, right? Kalanak tilted his head to one side. That probably doesn't translate very well. Have a good flight. Trip will call you soon to talk about Bart Campbell. He's running a reconstruction of the night he went missing, which includes getting all the people in the restaurant back together again. She fumbled, reaching forward to kiss his cheek, bashing her nose into his ear. You okay? he asked, holding her shoulder. God, yes, fine, just in a hurry, take it easy. Hmm? So glad we're good. Yes, ma'am, Kalanak said, picking up his bag. I'll call Natasha every day, but let me know if there's any news she's not telling me, will you? Of course, Ava said. Let's chat soon. She turned and headed for the exit. Let's chat soon, she repeated in her head. Nice retreat into corporate speak. She stopped at her car, dropping her forehead onto its roof. He was fine. That was good. All the tension and agonizing over what had or still might happen between them was gone. Life was simple again. Kalanach was over her. The raindrops on her face were the camouflage she needed to pretend she didn't care. Chapter 19 By the time she arrived at Edinburgh City Mortuary, Ava was soaked to the skin. Having a raincoat in her car was second nature, but worry for Natasha had resulted in sleeplessness that was taking a toll on her normal routines. She'd found her car keys in the fridge the previous day and her last load of washing had sat wet in the machine for forty-eight hours before she'd remembered to take it out. Now, no raincoat. There were small things, but Ava knew her brain was elsewhere. A slight figure sat completely still in the post-mortem suite that Ava was directed to, hands in her lap, staring at a computer screen, head to one side as if she were contemplating a sunset rather than images of a skull. Eva had met her once before at a forensics conference. Dr. Lien Chen was one of the most admired forensic anthropologists in Europe. The deputy pathologist hustled in behind Eva, shutting the door noisily behind them. Morning, he said. Do you two know each other? Dr. Chen stood up and extended a small hand that was cool in Eva's still damp fingers. DCI Tana she said softly. Pleased to meet you again. Shall we sit? They convened around a table with a computer screen central to them. The two skull sections from the pig farm sat in covered trays to one side. Time has been limited, so these are preliminary findings, Dr. Chen explained, handing out copies of a report that was several pages long. If that was preliminary, Ava thought, Lena Chen was thorough to the point of obsessive. Exactly what was needed. These skull sections are both current, meaning they're from recently living humans. This isn't an accidental unearthing of historic bodies or a cold case. They're both from females. Male skulls tend to be heavier, and while we did not have the full skull, we performed a pro rata weight comparison. The bone is thinner, than we usually find in male skulls, and there are positional and scale differences in the eyes and forehead. We've been able to confirm that, the deputy pathologist added. The pigs weren't able to get all the way inside the skull bones to completely clean out all the tissue. Even though it wasn't visible at first sight, there were sufficient cells left for DNA testing. Both were definitely female, as is the trachea. No matches have come up on the police database, though. Can we tell if the deceased are related? Eva asked him. They are not, he confirmed. Rough ages and cause of death? The first skull belonged to a woman I would estimate as being in her mid-thirties. The second, which is the less complete skull section, is between late teenage and early twenties. The more intact of the two had no skull injury at all. 
The less complete skull, belonging to the younger woman, had one completely healed fracture, which I would say is historical, maybe from ten years earlier, but also a recent blunt force trauma, which left an indent and a small fracture. Dr. Chen picked up one of the skulls from a tree and indicated an area at the rear. It's not a complete injury area, as the pigs had started to consume this part of the skull, so I'm unable to give precise parameters for the damage. It's possible that this injury was the cause of death, but far from definite. And the trachea? Eva turned to the pathologist. There's a substantial crushing injury, he said, almost certainly the cause of death, unless there were any other incidents occurring at the same time. Part of the trachea was almost flattened. Could that have happened post-mortem, maybe trampling from the pigs? Ava asked. No, this was very localised, specific pressure, and damage in a small area as if two thumbs had been pressed into the front of the trachea. Classic strangulation marks. And the internal bruising wouldn't have shown if the injury had been post-mortem, he explained. We can't be precise about age, but the trachea is adult in scale, with little wear or fatty deposits. We're assuming young female. It does make sense, Ava said. If strangulation was the cause of death, and the perpetrator was sufficiently careful about disposing of the body, it seems an awfully lucky coincidence that it was the trachea alone that survived. Actually, there might be an explanation, Dr. Chen said. If the trachea was the most damaged part of the body, the pigs might have been attracted to that area first from the smell. In the rush and the fight, it makes sense that it got pushed under the fence in the melee alongside the partially consumed clavicle. We got no DNA from that, but indications are that it too was from a recently deceased female. Did all these women die at the same time? Eva asked. Impossible to say precisely, the pathologist said. Dr. Chen nodded her agreement. The few soft tissue cells left inside the skulls weren't sufficient for us to be clear about that. The trachea, though, showed no signs of long-term degradation, so we believe that was a relatively recent death, by which I mean the death had taken place no more than a week prior to the body part being found. So, I had three dead women, different ages, not related, with potentially different causes of death, and none of them has an identifiable DNA match. You'd think if three women had gone off the grid at the same time, we'd have enough families complaining to the police that this would make sense. I would assume death at the same time, body disposal at the same time, Dr. Chen said. The skulls were similarly dirty and at sufficiently close stages of being consumed. The pigs did their work well, but they'd have needed another 24 hours to have worked through the last parts of the skulls. Do we have any teeth yet? Eva asked. Some, but not all, the pathologist said. A couple of them have fillings, others have specific damage and wear. As soon as you have any idea of the victim's identities, if they have up-to-date dental records, we'll have a shot at confirming who they are. So I just need to figure out what links them, Eva said. Pain, Dr. Chen said, staring into the empty eye sockets of the most complete skull. The woman who had two skull injuries? That's unusual. Very few people experience two skull fractures in their lifetime. Those who do are either unlucky in the extreme or they're living in circumstances where the statistical possibility of this type of skull fracture happening is markedly raised. Abusive relationships, drugs or prostitution then, Eva said. Exactly, the pathologist said. These women were regarded as disposable. The strangulation victim is the best example. I read an article recently that equated strangulation with waterboarding in terms of how torturous it is. It can be slow, drawn out, stopped and started again, and it's intimate. The murderer wanted to feel powerful, to be up close and personal with their victim. People who strangle want to look into their victim's eyes while they do it. It's rarely defensive. Which raises the question, Eva mused, are we looking for a single killer or for several? Chapter 20 
Kalanach checked his stab-proof vest and made sure his gun had its safety engaged. He was less concerned about shooting himself accidentally than he was about the prospect of someone grabbing the gun from its holster. Saint-Denis wasn't the no-go zone in Paris that the international press had made it out to be, but the police weren't welcome there. Layers of mistrust had built up on both sides. Saint-Denis had been labelled as troubled, courtesy of its high immigrant population. But that ignored the many peaceable, hard-working people who lived there, and punished the many for harbouring the very few. Over time, an animosity had grown from the reputation, rendering the streets occasionally unsafe for no other reason than a lack of mutual respect and understanding. Two undercover police officers, one male, one female, stood in a doorway waiting for Jean-Paul and Kalanach to appear from their unmarked police van. Both had been in close contact with Paris's subcultures for years. Neither stepped forward out of the shadows to greet them. The woman had a scarf covering most of her face, and the man had his hood up. Kalanach and Jean-Paul were dressed in tatty jeans and bulky jackets, their own hoods shielding their faces from recognition. She's Lebanese. Joseph's Nigerian, Jean-Paul whispered. They'll get us where we need to go and translate. But they need trouble, and we're on our own, waiting for backup. They're both too valuable to the intelligence services to be compromised. Understood, Kalanach confirmed, as a door opened behind them and they wandered into a dark alleyway. A false roof had been constructed of tarpaulins, plates of corrugated iron, and wooden planks strung on ropes from the windows above. Here and there, buckets collected the invading rainwater. It was light enough to make out where you were walking, but dim enough for privacy, and no helicopter or drone could see within. The overlooking windows offered no view. Kalanach understood the desire for privacy. Paris's migrant communities had been marginalised courtesy of the terrorist few and were largely misunderstood and harshly judged. As a result, relations with the authorities were poor, and no one side was entirely to blame. Doorways into the buildings at either side remained open, and from within the scents of incest and marijuana, coffee, mulled liquor, and every spice conceivable wafted out. Shouts came from distant rooms. Those sitting in the makeshift corridor whispered their conversations, growing silent and watchful as the team passed, heads down. Rounding a corner, they moved inside a building and into a large hallway. The heat produced by the multitude of bodies was stifling. They stuck close together, the undercover police flanking them front and back. The largest group surrounded a raucous cockfight in one corner. Vendors called out, offering meat from sources best left unexplored, and trays of tiny packets containing different coloured tablets adorned several tables, all well protected by men unconcerned about showing their guns. The Lebanese officer tugged Kalanach's sleeve, pulling him to one side and out through another doorway, then up some decrepit steps that had no right still to be standing. Jean-Paul and Joseph following closely. Curious eyes watched them leave. Kalanach forced himself not to turn back. Any sign of concern would only be met with even greater interest. At the top of the stairs, they climbed in through an open window. A crimson-lit corridor ran in each direction. They took the left into an eerie quiet compared to the market hall below. A girl sobbed in one room as they passed. A thumping behind the next door conjured images of a man hitting the internal wall. The next door opened abruptly. A man stared out at them, bared his teeth and slammed the door again. Here? Jean-Paul asked, as they paused outside another door. Through this door, then another, the Lebanese officer said in French. I'll wait here. Joseph will go with you. Keep your hands on your guns and don't trust her. She turned her back as they went inside, sliding her right hand into her jacket pocket. 
Kalanak saw the undertow of fear beneath the studied calm on her face. Inside the second room, three men were laid out on the floor, a syringe hanging from one banded arm. Jean-Paul and Kalanak covered their noses and mouths and stepped quietly to a smaller door with peeling grey-green paint. Beyond that, they were met with a series of sheets, hung like veils for three or four metres from ceiling to floor, the glow of golden light reaching through to guide them onwards. Joseph put a finger over his lips. They kept their footsteps soft. As they lifted the final sheet, a square, low-ceilinged room opened up and a woman spun around, a lime dripping, freshly cut in her right hand, a serrated knife glinting in her left. What do you want? Madame Lebel demanded, pointing the knife in Joseph's direction. Her French was fluent, the accent obscured by her native Somalian tongue. Information, Joseph replied, peeling a wad of sweaty euros out from where they'd been tucked inside his shirt. Dirty money, the woman hissed. You come here with two white men? No appointment pushing your filth at me? I know what you are. She jabbed the knife into a wooden cutting board, throwing the lime onto the floor at Joseph's feet. He edged backwards. Take the money, Joseph said quietly. Listen to their questions. If you help us, we'll leave you alone. The woman reached out her hand, slid her fingers into a fridge door and pulled it open. Kalanach released the safety trigger from his gun. From the upper shelf of the fridge door, she pulled a chunk of pink meat wrapped in thin wire. Holding it in front of her face, she untwisted a metal screw from the meat, running her tongue along the metal before spitting it towards Jean-Paul. You want me to tell you the things I know? She laughed. If I told you everything I've seen, you would fall down dead right there. Kalanach frowned at the theatrics. They were costing them time and this room had only one way in and one way out. No windows, no escape route. He'd been briefed on the woman's history in the car. There was nothing to be gained by cajoling. You perform operations on young girls at their parents' request, he said. You were prosecuted once before, but the child's mother told the court it was another woman who'd performed the circumcision. She protected you because she was scared of you. The woman grinned, showing sharp teeth. Kalanach realized they'd been filed. The effect was chilling. It was hard to imagine a better way to ensure the silence of her clients. Her mouth was a brilliantly constructed nightmare. The rings on her fingers weren't fake, though. Stuck in a stinking inner city hell, she was earning serious money. Are you scared of me? she asked him. No, Kalanak said. The ox tongue in your hand is just protein. The screw you took out of it is just hardware. There are no spells. You convince people that there are, but you don't believe any of it. I am a healer. I don't perform operations. It's all lies. She ran a hand over her shaved hair, showing long nails painted bright white. The file had said she was forty-nine, but she looked younger. Most people in saint -Denis looked older than their years. She was thriving. Either way, you're selling a service, Kalanak said. So take our money. It's as good as anyone else's. Joseph passed her half the bundle of notes. She walked to him, counting each note out slowly, taking her time. Kalanak kept half an eye on her as he flicked his gaze across the surroundings. A thin mattress on the floor was home to stains he couldn't bear to think about. A knife set, laid out in a leather case, sparkled in the candlelight. Bottles, jars, sprigs of leaves and feathers adorned endless shells. If it weren't for the stench of old bodily fluids that hung in the air, it could have been a film set. Of course, for all intents and purposes, that was what it was, just an illusion. Someone is selling human organs in Paris, he said. 
We want to know who, why, and how we can find them. There's certainly a market for it, she said, rolling the money into a ball and secreting it smoothly into a sleeve. But human organs are hard to get hold of unless you live in a war zone. Who would want them? Jean-Paul asked. A chef? She licked her lips. Stop it, Kalanach told her. You're peddling myths and hoodoo here. What use are human organs put to if they're not transplanted? You're thinking witchcraft, she grinned. What makes you think I know anything about that? Are they used in curses? Kalanach asked. Or for sacrifices? Why is your imagination so dark? You came here assuming that everything I do is evil and for profit. I help people. Perhaps whoever is selling these organs is trying to help people too. This is helping people, Jean-Paul asked, his eyes fixed on the bloody mattress. Does anyone who comes in here survive? Don't judge me. You think a fourteen-year-old girl from a strict Muslim family who finds herself pregnant can get an abortion without her parents signing the forms? Do you know what her father would do if he found out I save lives? Female genital mutilation doesn't save lives, Joseph said. My knives are clean and I cut away as little as possible. My stitches are small. Ask the women whose grandmothers were given the task with kitchen knives if they'd rather their parents had come to me, hypothetically speaking. Better it didn't happen at all, Jean-Paul said. It's not my job to change minds, she said. Perhaps if you did your jobs better. Have you heard of anyone offering organs for sale recently? Kalanach asked. Rumors, she said. But I don't help the police. In case you hadn't noticed, you tried to have me locked up. We have information about your daughter, Jean-Paul said. Kalanach stared at him. That nugget hadn't been shared in the car. There was a long pause. My daughter is fine. She lives in the next block. You people will say anything. Not that one. Jean-Paul continued. You have another daughter, Elise, who disappeared. Only she turned up in Syria, married to an ISIS commander. You've been trying to make contact with her for the last year. Did you really think intelligence services wouldn't pick it up? Madame Lebel dropped down onto an ancient couch. Tell me, she said. Information first. Kalanach folded his arms. What do the rumors say? That using the organs, you can be healed of literally anything. They offer a consultation and treatment. It's expensive and clever. All a scam, of course. Do you have a name? Jean-Paul asked. Where's my daughter? Still in Syria. She's alive but has had to move around a lot with ISIS territory losses. She's on her second husband. Her first was killed in a drone strike. Madame Labelle wrapped her arms around herself and rocked backwards and forwards. I told her this would happen. What do you know about the person behind this? Kalanach asked. Nothing factual. Someone said it's a woman. But it always is when it's medical and there's an element of mystery involved. Walk onto any city street and say the word doctor to a crowd and most will still immediately assume you're talking about a man. Say black magic and everyone thinks witches and broomsticks. Some of the very sick people who come to me for help have heard about these amazing cures. They don't want to believe it's all lies. It should be stopped. It damages all our reputations. Kalanach bit back his desire to tell her what he thought of the services she offered and the lives they ruined. No amount of cultural differences could justify the mutilation of girls too young to defend themselves.
or make their own choices. How do people get in touch with her? He asked. You don't. You make your condition, your needs, known to the right people, and she contacts you. Will my daughter be allowed to return to France? Will she be arrested? I don't know, Jean-Paul told her. If it appears that she went willingly, if she conspired with a terrorist group, then it's possible she will refuse re-entry into the country or prosecuted if she does return. Technically, she can't be left stateless, but she would have to agree to go into a de-radicalization program at the very least. Has she been hurt? Did they treat her well? I've had nothing. Others had told me she's not allowed to communicate with anyone outside. There were tears now. Kalanach steeled himself against them. Madame Lebel was profiting from others' barbaric beliefs. She had no moral compass. It was easy to see how her daughter was repeating those mistakes. Our information is that she's had a child. You're a grandmother, Jean-Paul said quietly. I have a photograph, but you need to put us in contact with the right people. If anyone thinks I help the police, my throat will be slit while I sleep. So be careful, Kalanak said. Fuck you, she offered in response. We have to get out of here. Joseph said. Jean-Paul took a photo from his pocket, keeping its blank face to Madame Lebel. She fixed her eyes on it. There's a clinic on Villa Curial. It's a support centre for people suffering from life-threatening illnesses. They offer counselling, non-medical therapies, assistance with getting benefits or dealing with employers, that sort of thing. Whoever is offering these so-called treatments has contacts inside that clinic, and others. They figure out who might be a good client and make an offer. That is all I know. Now give me the photograph and the rest of the money. Raised voices from the room they'd walked through stopped them in their tracks. Here, Jean-Paul said, handing the photo over. Kalanach caught a glimpse of a young woman photographed from some distance above. It was blurred, but her face was showing and there was a baby in her lap where she sat in a tiny backyard, barbed wire marking out the boundary of the property. It was impossible to say if the wire was to keep the woman in or to keep others out. Most likely both, he decided. Madame Lebel gave a small cry and sat, cradling the photo. Keep quiet about who we are and what we asked you, and I'll arrange to get you further updates about your daughter. Agreed? Yes, Madame Lebel said. Thank you. Yes. The door crashed open. The Lebanese police officer had her weapon drawn and pointed at the three previously sleeping men, now very much awake, knives drawn. Joseph reacted first, not hesitating to draw his own gun, stepping forward and barking orders in a language Kalanach didn't understand. The effect was immediate. The men dropped back a few paces allowing Jean-Paul and Kalanach the space to get out of the veiled corridor. Go, Joseph ordered. They filed out into the main corridor, following Joseph. Not the way we came, he said. It's not safe now. Someone will have phoned down to say we were here. What happened? Jean-Paul asked. White men seen going into Madame Lebel's rooms, Joseph said, as he rounded a corner, checking first that no one was waiting for them. The range of services she offers tends to be for minorities around here. The assumption is that you're police. Down the staircase, quickly. He motioned them forwards. Shall I call for backup? Jean-Paul asked. Only if you want to kick off a major incident. As soon as they hear sirens, each door will be locked and there will be a weapon in every hand. Let's get to a lower floor and try a window. Footsteps behind them were approaching fast. They opened the nearest door and slammed it behind them. There was no key. Joseph held it shut, racing his feet against the bottom as he leaned back, holding the doorknob tight. Peeling back the paper over the windows that had been improvised as curtains in what seemed to be an abandoned storeroom, they looked down to the ground. 
They were 15 feet above ground level, overlooking a rear passageway that led out onto the street. The door rattled. Joseph gripped the doorknob more firmly as Jean-Paul tried to open the window. In spite of its rotting frame, it wouldn't budge. Kalanach kicked a pile of boxes aside, finding nothing but mildew and a dead rat. Hurry, Joseph said. There were shouts beyond the door now, more people approaching. Kalanach took out his gun, re-engaged the safety, and aimed the butt of it centrally in the window, covering his face. The third blow smashed the pane. He ran to the door, grabbing the handle from Joseph, Jean-Paul standing back to provide cover. You two jump first, Kalanach told the undercover officers, and just disappear. You don't want to get caught with us. Make sure Control knows our position and is ready to pick us up. They didn't argue, clearing the remaining glass with the cardboard and jumping immediately. Jean-Paul waited until they were both down and out of sight, sitting on the window ledge with his feet hanging out. I'll cover you, he said. When you're ready, run for the window and just jump. I'll be right behind you. The door was beginning to splinter from the kicks beyond. The fact that no one had tried to shoot through the wood yet was a good sign, but even if Kalanach and Jean-Paul were the only ones with firearms, there were enough bodies out in the corridor to pose a serious threat. Kalanach took a deep breath and positioned himself to run. It was only four strides from the door to the window, but by then the door was wide open and men were rushing in. There was a gunshot as Kalanach grabbed the ledge to vault out. Then he hit cool air and sunlight, his stomach objecting to the fall. He hit the ground hard, one ankle giving way. He let himself relax, falling, rolling, getting straight back up and seeing Jean-Paul midair. There were angry faces in the window above. Kalanach drew his gun and fired at the wall above the window, aiming to miss any live targets, but dissuading them from following. Come on! he yelled at Jean-Paul. He was still on the ground, rubbing at his eyes. Shit! Did you land badly? Burning! Jean-Paul screamed. Kalanach squatted beside him, putting one arm around his shoulders, keeping his gun aimed up at the window. Got to move! he said. Let me help you. Jean-Paul got to his feet, one arm across his upper face, the other clutching Kalanach's shoulder. They staggered away along the passage. As they reached the archway that welcomed them into the street, the men began to jump from the window. A black van screeched to a halt in front of them. A side door opened, and men in black clothes dragged Kalanach and Jean-Paul inside. It's all right, Joseph told them from the back of the van. You are safe. Jean-Paul, let me see your face, Kalanach said. His friend pulled his arm away. Everything from his lips to the peak of his forehead was red and beginning to blister. Small pockets of yellow liquid were already forming across the tops of his cheeks. His eyes were raw, filmy and closing as the irritant worked into his body. Hospital, Kalanach ordered the driver. They screeched around a corner, meeting a horde of bodies exiting the building. Turn right, Joseph said, drawing his gun again as fists began to thump the rear of the vehicle. Kalanach sat on the van floor, his friend's head resting on his thighs, his breathing laboured, rasping. As they left the angry crowd behind, joined ahead and behind by police cars that eased their passage through Paris's gridlock, he wished it hadn't taken him two years to return to France and to bridge the void between the two of them. Chapter 21 The restaurant wasn't one of Edinburgh's best known, but it was well loved by its regular clientele. Today it was closed to the public as the major investigation team worked with a camera crew and uniformed officers booked in those people they knew had been dining or working there the night Bart Campbell had disappeared. It was a full house. Two people working the bar. The owner-manager was on site. Five waiters, including Bart. Seven bodies in the kitchen. And every table full. There was only one CCTV camera, and it had captured nothing of value as there was a second door through which anyone could have come and gone without detection. A lack of internal cameras meant that there was no record of what had happened inside. 
Only three people had proved uncontactable in terms of bookings. All were last-minute walk-ins. The cameras rolled. A young actor had been engaged to play Bart. He could be seen working his usual tables, moving from bar to kitchen. Witnesses were released once they'd played their parts and confirmed their earlier statements. Finally, they filmed a section where Bart sat at the bar for a few minutes, all his tables cleared, the last few diners remaining, being served by the two waiters still working. He had a drink in front of him that he drained, before putting on his jacket and heading for the front door. His exit had been caught on camera, and that section was to be replaced by the original footage. Then the actor took over again as Bart headed away from the restaurant towards the lamppost where he always locked up his bike. One of the media team's liaison officers then got to his feet, explaining the procedure for contacting the helpline with useful information. Filming was rapping when Ava turned up. Tripp was deep in conversation with the editor from the production company they'd used, setting a timeline for getting the footage out. The restaurant manager was treading a fine line between looking deeply concerned for his employees' well-being and deeply concerned about getting his restaurant reopened for trade. A woman on the corner of the street was looking into the restaurant, hands lifeless at her sides, face blank, swaying slightly. Ava walked to where she stood. I'm TCI Ava Turner. You all right? The woman looked at her. The skin beneath her eyes so dark she might have taken punches. But Ava recognised grief like a brand. All shallow breathing, scrunched muscles and twitchy faraway stares. Sorry, we haven't met. Are you Bart's mother? The woman gave a single sharp nod. Come with me. They walked to a table outside the restaurant and sat. Ava took the arm of a passing police officer. Could you ask the manager for a pot of tea, please? I'll pay. Mrs. Campbell sat to attention, unable to take her eyes off the scene unfolding within and the young man standing in for her son, who was in the process of changing back into his own jacket. He bore an uncanny resemblance to Bart, Ava saw. It must have been almost ghostly for his mother. Reconstructions were hard on victims' families. Forever having last known moments reduced to a film strip to be viewed over and over again. More often than not, such events were recorded at a stage too late to change the course of events. Ava hoped that wouldn't prove true for Bart. She waited for the tea to arrive before attempting any further conversation pouring a cup and adding a spoonful of sugar when Mrs. Campbell didn't respond to the question of whether she wanted it or not. She managed to pick up the cup and take a shaky sip. What's Bart like? Ava asked. Easy to love, Mrs. Campbell replied. Ava felt a lump form in her throat. How long will you keep looking for him? As long as it takes. Ava said. We're just getting started. Thank you for all the photos you gave us. It really helps. Publicity is very important. I don't feel anything, Mrs. Campbell said. I've heard people say they knew when their child was dead, or that they felt they were still alive. I have no sense of them at all. Am I doing something wrong? No, Ava said. Everyone feels things differently, and sometimes people imagine a sensation or a link that makes processing their experience easier. It's obvious that you and Bart are extremely close. So I can see why you would feel there should be a tangible sense of what's happening to him. There's a dead boy, isn't there? she asked. Eva hesitated. The link between Malcolm Riley and Bart Campbell was still speculative, and she'd made the decision not to have officers pass the details of Malcolm's death on to Bart's family and friends. Now she was going to be asked questions that Mrs. Campbell really wouldn't want her to answer. There is, Eva said. I believe you were asked if Bart knew him, and you said no. That's right. But then I looked it up on the internet. 
I found an article, but it was in French. The translation from the search engine was... Eva could imagine. The true facts were awful enough without filtering them through a search engine. There's no evidence that Bart is with the same people who are responsible for Malcolm, Eva said. We need to investigate all possibilities. I know it's hard not to overthink, but speculation is a dark cave. How did Malcolm disappear? she asked. Eva didn't want to answer. But better that Mrs. Campbell got the facts from her than spending hours on the internet, wandering into God only knew what forums and true crime chat rooms. He was at his gym. It looks as if he met up with a woman briefly, followed her out, then he wasn't seen again. His body was found in Paris. One of our officers is over there working with Interpol and the French police. D.S. Tripp patted Eva on the shoulder. Mum, you're needed inside urgently, he said. Mrs. Campbell, are you warm enough? I can make space for you inside. No, thank you, she said. I don't think I can. Tripp nodded respectfully, motioning for another officer to join them, whispering in his ear. The policeman sat down at the table as Ava stood up, immediately picking up the teapot to refill Mrs. Campbell's cup. A flash of gratitude hit Ava for her squad. They were fierce and relentless when needed, caring and gentle in the alternative. A rare breed. At a table indoors, a man and woman were looking wide-eyed at one another. Mr. and Mrs. Williams, Tripp whispered. They're regulars. They know Bart from the times he served them. Ava sat down at the table with them and introduced herself. The Williamses were in their late sixties, maybe early seventies, and sat, holding hands. Ava smiled, in spite of the circumstances. I wonder if you could tell DCI Turner what you told me just now, Tripp said. You see it, Mrs. Williams told her husband. All right then. We were in a bit later than usual as we hadn't been able to find our cat. We don't like her being out too long in the evening. She had a tendency to get into fights, he said. She does, Mrs. Williams agreed. So it took a while to find her. Then we arrived here at about half past eight, and then it was busy, so we didn't get served for ages. That's not a criticism. He turned his head and looked in the direction of the manager. Anyway, we didn't get our main course until about nine thirty. I had lasagna, and my wife had the cannelloni. Eva didn't rush the story. Whatever spell had been cast in the Williams's recollections by virtue of the reconstruction was worth maintaining. We'd had pudding and were taking our time over coffee when I moved my chair back so my wife could get to the bathroom. We'd been rather squashed into our table as it was so busy. Again, not a criticism. He is such a gentleman, his wife added. Anyway, the back of my chair hit something. There was no table directly behind me, so I hadn't been careful and looked the way I normally would. I saw a woman standing at the bar next to young Bart. It was her leg I'd bashed. I apologised immediately, but she just tossed her hair, didn't acknowledge the apology or me. We gave each other a look, as you do. Mrs. Williams said. I might not have remembered. She was there one minute and gone the next. But my wife commented on the size of the ring she was wearing. He nodded at his wife, who continued the tale. Very ostentatious, she said in a half whisper, as if the woman were still there and might be offended. A sapphire, if it was real. It looked like one of those efforts you sometimes see sold on those television jewellery sales programmes, you know, dear? I do, Ava said. May I ask which finger she was wearing it on? Her ring finger, like you would an engagement ring. 
My mother would have called it flashy, by which she'd have meant trashy. Mrs. Williams gave a wink. Can you recall anything else about her? Eva asked. Brown hair. She had a long coat on, so I couldn't be more specific about clothes. She'd have been in her mid-twenties. Attractive, in an obvious sort of way, Mrs. Williams said. Could you spend some time working with one of our artists, see if you can come up with a likeness of her? Eva asked. Anything for Bart, Mr. Williams announced. He's a lovely boy. I only hope this helps. I'd have never thought about it without doing this. Your police officer there coached us to think through each course and remember everyone around us. It wasn't until I shifted my chair back again to leave that the moment prompted the memory he's a good one he is. Ava smiled at Tripp. He is indeed, she said. Thanks so much for your time and assistance. Will you excuse me? DS Trip will take over again from here. She shook their hands and rejoined Bart's mother at the outside table. Mrs. Campbell? Maggie, please. Maggie, Eva smiled. I know you've been asked this before, but are you absolutely sure Bart wasn't seeing anyone? A woman who might have been a little older than him, for example, or someone who'd shown an interest in him at the restaurant? No one, she said. He's a very open boy. We don't have secrets. I know all his friends, who's seeing who. If he's interested in a girl, he tells me I'm not judgmental. He'd have had no reason to have kept quiet about it. So there's nothing he wouldn't have told you? No, she said. I wouldn't have cared. Bart knows he can tell me anything. I just wanted him to find someone who made him happy. I see, Eva said. Thank you. The only thing I put my foot down about, ever, was him messing around with someone who was already taken, she continued. Bart's father felt the same, old-fashioned values, and proud of it. Eva looked at the Williamses, who were writing out new statements with Tripp. So, if there had been someone in his life who was, say, engaged or married, Bart would have known you wouldn't approve? Eva asked, quietly. I sincerely hope he'd never do anything so wrong. He was well aware of my feelings on the subject, she said. He certainly wouldn't have dared bring her under my roof. My boy knows better than that. Chapter 22 Kalanak stood in the second hospital in his many days, waiting for news on another friend. He ran over the sequence of events in his head for the hundredth time, wondering what he could have done differently, wishing they'd secured a better route out of the building before getting themselves trapped. They were lucky it had only been a fifteen-foot drop. Any farther than that, and they'd all have impact injuries. Kalanak's ankle ached like hell. Joseph had sprained his wrist in the fall, and his cover was blown. His partner had already been reassigned to a different city, and still none of that compared to what Jean-Paul was going through. Interpol had called in a chemical weapons expert, and all attending doctors were white-suited and fully masked. Detective Inspector Kalanak? A woman asked him. He nodded. Your friend would like to see you. Please don't touch him and keep your suit done up at all times. We have some preliminary findings, but until they are confirmed, it's not worth taking any risks. Ten minutes later, he was at Jean-Paul's bedside, trying not to look alarmed at the bulging yellow blisters covering his friend's face and hands. His eyes were covered with patches and a drip fed into his arm. The blinds were drawn, the only light a pale blue bulb at the far end of the room. Jean-Paul, it's me, he said. I'd kiss you, only you look gross. I thought you should know. Fuck you. Jean-Paul sniggered, then winced. Don't make me fucking laugh. This hurts like a bitch. Have they told you what caused the damage? Well, it wasn't polonium, so the Russians are off the hook and I'm not contagious. 
Turns out it was a bit less low-tech. The doctors think they brushed a giant hogweed across my face. When I put my hands up to rub it away, my hands got the pollen as well. It's just a plant. Want to swap places with me and see if you think it's just an anything? Jean-Paul held his hands up for Kalanach to see. Looks like whoever did this was cultivating it deliberately. Needs a fair degree of sunlight for the plant to reach toxicity, and they knew what they were doing. Clever. It's natural, legal to grow, cheap, and it takes your enemy down in no time. Shit, Kalanach muttered. What about your eyesight and the scarring? There are very few cases of long-term blindness. The doctors are pretty certain I'll recover. The blisters need careful treatment and some scarring is inevitable. Bloody lucky it wasn't your face in the firing line, right? By now half of Europe would have been lined up to mourn the tragic loss of your beauty. I could shoot you and put you out of your misery, if it would help. Kalanach laughed. How's the pain? I have the morphine option that I'm currently avoiding, although I suspect I'll be making use of it if I want to get any sleep tonight. He shifted onto his side, gritting his teeth. I want to be back on this investigation, Luke. I have to avoid natural light for a while. I'm sorry. You'll either be assigned a new partner from Interpol, or you can work directly with French police. You're in charge, Nalto. You know this case better than anyone. I just got a message from MIT in Edinburgh. The other missing person, Bart Campbell, had contact with a woman just before he disappeared. Malcolm Riley confided in his father about being interested in a married woman. It's possible both men were being primed by the same woman to gain their trust and to ask them to keep the relationship quiet because she was or was pretending to be married. That would explain the Scottish end of the operation. But what are you going to do about the clinic Madame Lebert mentioned here? You'll need to establish a presence as soon as possible. Your backstory has to be credible, with paperwork available from a doctor in case they check it out. Even then, you're not guaranteed contact. It'll be almost impossible to put a trace on every person who works at or with the clinic to find the communication route. I'll just have to build up a strong profile and hope for the best. We can't notify any of the clinic staff. There could be more than one person involved, and if they figure out that we're watching, they'll just shut the operation down and move on to a different city. I wish this hadn't happened, Jean-Paul. It was good to be working with you again, Kalanach said. Are you going to cry? Only, if you are, it'll be worth taking the patches off my eyes to see it. I never thought the great Luc Alanach would get sentimental. Now, get out of here. You have work to do. If Bart Campbell has been taken by the same people who killed Malcolm Riley, he's got limited time. I'm going, Kalanach said. Are we okay? You mean today or before? Jean-Paul reached for his medication button and pressed for a dose of painkillers. All of it, Kalanach said. Touch Malcolm Riley's killers and don't end up dead in the process. Then we'll have this conversation, Jean-Paul muttered. Kalanach opened the door. And bring me in a bottle of Poyac de la Tour. Bastards won't even let me have a glass of red. Kalanach left with a smile on his face. One of his friends was going to make a full recovery. He only wished he could be so certain about Natasha's future. At least he and Eva had reached a sort of impasse, even if it wasn't the conclusion he'd hoped for. Right now, she needed to focus on Natasha, and that meant him backing off. At least the geographical distance between them made it easier to bear. It took four hours for Interpol to set up a fake medical file with a registered doctor's surgery in the city, then another two hours for Kalanach to study his supposed medical condition sufficiently to be conversant with all its symptoms, medications, side effects and prognosis before he felt confident enough. 
to walk through the doors of the clinic on Villa Curial. He'd been given drops to yellow the whites of his eyes and was wearing baggy clothes to disguise his muscle tone. The clinic was larger and busier than he'd expected. The internal decor was shades of white and pale green, with wide plastic chairs that combined relative comfort with ease of cleaning. Information posters adorned notice boards, and there was a hush about the place that had echoes of every medical waiting room he'd ever been in. It wasn't up to private hospital standards, but it was indistinguishable from most standard doctor's surgeries. He waited in a queue to be seen, running over the details in his mind, recalling the new mobile number he'd been given. Eventually, he was given a wad of forms to complete and told to hand them in to the woman at the end of the counter. Twenty minutes later, and he walked slowly up to start the process of booking some therapies. The woman took her time reading his forms before giving him a sympathetic look. Come through to our private consultation room, Monsieur Chevote, she said. It's not easy to talk out here. He followed her into a room with three small sofas positioned in a triangle, a central coffee table holding a candle and coasters, and several lamps but no overhead lighting. He moved carefully, conscious of the information he'd just imparted. Ideally, he'd have liked more hours for research, but time was the only resource Interpol couldn't provide. He had bank cards in his new name with actual money available, and an address that could be verified with public records backing it up. Everything he needed, except a firm lead on Malcolm Riley's killer. Please, call me Luke, he said as he sat down. He left his first name unchanged to make the pseudonym easier to use, and to avoid immediate blunders if he bumped into anyone he knew. My name is Lucille Blaise. I see you have advanced liver failure, Monsieur Chevote. I'm so sorry. The prognosis? She sat, pen poised over her file, her nails decorated with tiny sparkling stones that caught the lamplight and reflected against the dim ceiling. Not good, he said simply. We do ask for verification of identity for our files, and also that our professionals be able to contact your primary care doctor. Are you happy with that? Of course, he said, sliding the driver's license that had been in his wallet for just sixty minutes across the table to her. I already ticked the box about contacting my doctor. Wonderful. Our work here is varied. There was a soft knock on the door, and a man entered wearing slippers. Kalanach couldn't help but stare at his silent feet as he glided across the room. Ah, this is one of our counsellors. He had a free session, so I asked him to join us. I hope you don't mind. Luc Chevote, meet Bruno Plouf. Kalanach kept his seat, but extended his hand. Bruno Plouffe, complete with silver goatee beard and wire-rimmed spectacles, took Kalanach's hand in both of his. Allow me to explain a little about our organization, Plouffe said, sitting down. There are individual counseling sessions that range from the factual, often doctors don't have the time to explain what all their jargon means, talk about the side effects of medication, to discuss how treatment will physically feel, to the psychological. Some patients don't want to talk about nearing the end of their lives or about the limitations a chronic illness will put on them, but others do. Some patients are single. Others want counselling with their spouse or children to help the family come to terms with what's happening. The options are endless. Then... There's practical help and social groups. Meeting other people in the same position can be extremely beneficial. Treatments such as reflexology, aromatherapy, massage, hairdressers who use only products that won't inflame sensitivities during harsh medical treatments. We look at the whole you. It costs money, I'm afraid. I wish we were government-funded, but that hasn't happened yet. Fundraising only gets us so far. I understand, 
That's not a problem, and I am single with no children, so it's just me. Then I hope you'll come to regard us as part of your support network. Have your doctors offered you any hope longer term? Bruno asked. It's proving hard to find a donor match, but that's still an option. Certain symptoms are worse than others. I'm not too jaundiced yet, but I'm uncomfortable and my diet is severely restricted. There's nausea, vomiting, and the pain is getting worse. We have a wonderful pain clinic, Lucille interjected. I'll put in a referral. She made a note. Are you still able to work? Bruno asked. I'm a freelance coder. Boring stuff for financial websites mainly, but at least I work from home and my hours are flexible. I've had to cut my clients down to the bare minimum, but luckily my parents are financially stable and helping out. Lucille held out a variety of glossy brochures. Take these, have a look through. It'll give you a great idea of what we might be able to offer you, together with other clients' experiences of the clinic and our dedicated partners. Thanks, Karnak said. I was wondering, and I know this sounds desperate, I guess, but I was thinking about alternative therapies. The doctors aren't offering much, and I just want to feel as if I've really explored every option, like maybe something's been missed, you know? A lot of people feel like that, Bruno said, extending a gentle hand to rest on top of Kalanax. I hope it's not trite to say this, but it's almost a part of the process. We'll go through your diagnosis, and of course we can discuss every treatment option that's open to you. But you're getting good hospital care, Lucille added quickly. The consultant you've listed on your form is known to us, and he is excellent. Kalanach left it there. He didn't want to push too hard and arouse suspicion. You're right, he said, running a hand through his hair and shaking his head. I'm so sorry. I must sound awful with so many people trying to help me. Half the time I don't know what I'm saying or thinking these days. Look, Let's fix a psychotherapy session. You're in a bad place. The first one is free, so we can figure out if it's right for you. I offer hypnotherapy, too, if that's something you'd consider. My patients find it helps them deal with panic attacks. I have a space tomorrow at noon. Would that work? Bruno asked. Hypnotherapy sounds interesting. Thank you. Noon tomorrow is perfect, Kalanak said. I'm so pleased I found you. So are we, Lucille replied. Out of interest, we always like to know, how did you hear about us? A friend over at Saint-Denis. Her daughter needed some help recently. I won't say her name. She wouldn't want me talking about her. Quite. And we appreciate that sort of discretion. Sometimes we're able to offer a lot more help to people who have open minds and who are able to internalize their doubts. Sometimes, when people share the concept of what we do, their loved ones talk them out of it, as if only they are able to help. It's not a criticism. A family's grief is very real, but it imposes limits on what it's possible to achieve. Lucille stood up. We'll have to let you go for today, I'm afraid. This room will be needed in a minute. Of course, Kalanak said. I'll see you tomorrow. He gave them both a nod as he left. Out in the foyer, he walked around, peering into the rooms with glass doors. Several corridors led off in different directions. There was a wing for physical and beauty therapies, a clinical treatment centre, and other multi-purpose rooms that were obviously intended for larger groups, with chairs stacked against walls. Coffee and water machines, boxes of tissues and piles of magazines offered distractions in the waiting area. Rack after rack of brochures and information leaflets filled the space against the front windows. Staff came and went, calling first names only in soft voices and escorting clients to their destinations. 
It was like any other clinic. Kalanach wondered what Bart Campbell's chance of survival was if resorting to putting himself out there and hoping someone would find him was their best investigative path. Not great, was the honest answer. He sighed, shoved his hands deep in his pockets, and flexed his shoulders. Then there was Natasha. Here he was pretending to have a life-threatening illness when Natasha was in Scotland facing the real demon of breast cancer. He sucked in the guilt-laced irony. You okay? A subtly dressed security guard asked him. Can I get you some water? No, no, I'm fine, Kalanach reassured him. I can call you a cab or walk you somewhere if you need help. It's no problem. A lot of people come out feeling a bit wobbly. The guard was in his twenties, bordering on overweight, and the design of the uniform wasn't a great look. But his face was kind. Kalanach gave him a warm smile. It's past. I just feel a bit off color every now and then, but thanks. I appreciate the concern. No problem. I'm Alex. I'm here most days if you're coming back. Kalanach introduced himself, his fake self, and made a note of Alex's surname from his lapel badge. Alex Quint. A security guard would have access everywhere and know everyone. It made much more sense than trying to infiltrate the various departments of the clinic on an ad hoc basis. I'll be back uh, tomorrow, Kalanach told him. Will you be on duty then? It'd be good to see a face I recognize. I seem to spend all my time in hospital waiting rooms these days. Alex raised his eyebrows but didn't push it. Liver failure, Kalanach volunteered. Shit. Alex muttered. It was the most honest and best stated reaction Kalanach had heard since walking into the clinic. Sometimes all psychologically focused and politically correct response training did was water down humanity's connection to one another. Yeah, shit, Kalanach replied. Sure, I'll be here tomorrow, Alex said. Take it easy, man. Kalanach gave a mock salute and exited onto the street. By the time he'd rounded the nearest corner, he was on the phone to Interpol's headquarters, asking for a full intelligence and records check on Alex Quint. He needed some inside assistance, even if the person helping him had no idea who he really was. Chapter 23 D.I. Pax Graham looked like a giant, compared to the body laid out on the post-mortem suite table. And it wasn't just because of his height and frame, imposing as that was. Ava dragged herself into a disposable, fluid-resistant suit and joined her detective inspector and the deputy pathologist. They all stared down at the body. Ava sighed. Where's his head? she asked. No sign of it as yet, Graham responded. Was he alive when his head was cut off? Was that done later? The corpse was a mess, and that was a pretty high bar considering where they were and how many bodies they'd seen between them. Ava rubbed her forehead. The body was lying on its back, a sheet revealing only the section between the man's waist and his severed neck. I haven't had long with the body yet, but the spine is broken in several places, and there are large impact bruises on the back of the thighs, buttocks, back, and the rear of the arms. Also broken ribs, three of which puncture the left lung. I'd say a fall, followed by massive internal bleeding. The decapitation looks to me to have been aimed at avoiding identification. There's very little blood on either the plastic sheeting he was found in, or on the body, suggesting there was minimal blood loss as the head was removed. And the marks on the neck? The skin around the wound was destroyed. Strings of it lay limply against the table, and jagged slash marks went inches down what remained of the neck. It's a sawing wound. 
The long wisps of loose skin indicate the use of a manual saw rather than an electric one, hence the scratches where the saw has gone off course down the lower neck. The problem with a manual saw is that the more soft tissue gets caught in the blade, the more it gets tangled and clumps of flesh form. He pointed at a large lump of mangled tissue. Not that his point particularly needed illustrating. The picture was already clearly drawn. How did you conclude that it's an attempt to prevent identification? Graham asked. The pathologist pulled back the sheet to reveal the ends of the arms. They stopped at the wrists. Great, Ava muttered. How long to clear DNA processing and see if we can get a match on the police database? With the amount of work you've brought us recently, you'll need to allow five days. We're short-staffed and backed up, and you in court tomorrow, and I have people off sick, with other reports overdue. Could I see the whole body? Eva asked, just to build up a better picture. The pathologist peeled the sheet fully down. The lower body was intact. A variety of scars and tattoos decorated his skin. Eva stepped forward, taking a closer look at the ink work. Poor quality, she said. They look amateur to me. Could we turn him over? The pathologist manoeuvred the body for Eva to view the remaining skin. She sighed, unzipped her suit, put her gloved hand into her pocket and pulled out her mobile, stepping away from the body mindful of contamination. She speed-dialed a number, putting the call on speakerphone. Tell me I'm getting double time for answering a call at 3am when I'm not on duty, lively grouched. You can have this conversation from the comfort of your bed, or you can get your ass to the mortuary, Ava replied. Which would you prefer? Go ahead, lively replied. An abrupt click suggested that he'd woken up sufficiently to switch on a light. A few years ago, we arrested several men for an attempted robbery of a bookmaker's, remember? The prosecution didn't stick because the defence argued serious failings with disclosing our information source, and we didn't want to reveal that there was an informant. Yep, right balls up it was. One of the men we arrested was a standing joke around the station for months afterwards. he just had a baby and had got the kid's name tattooed on his back, only he'd spelled it wrong. Tyler, with an I instead of a Y, the trade, not the name. His wife had thrown a fit about it and given him a black eye. Ring any bells? Lively laughed. I'd forgotten that particular muppet, he said. Damn, that didn't get old for a very long time. Finlay Wilson, what a tosser. Finlay Wilson, thank you. Just couldn't dredge the name out of my brain. You heard much about him lately? Eva asked. Hasn't been arrested that I'm aware of. Kept his head down. But I've been running some scam or other. Vicious little bastard by reputation. Served plenty of time on and off when he was younger, but we never got him for anything major. He was connected, though. Everyone knows him. Plenty of people scared of him, too. You need me to tap some sources and bring him in for a chat? Won't be necessary. Eva said, peering at the Tyler tattoo on the right-hand shoulder blade of the corpse. He's with me right now. At the mortuary? Lively sounded fully awake. You mean he's finally got his comeuppance? And then some. You can get searching for his head and hands, if you like. They're still currently at liberty. Fuck me! There was the sound of smashing glass and mumbled additional cursing. You all right? Eva asked. Spilled some water, but it was worth it to hear that. Where was the body found? Eva nodded at Pax Graham to fill in the remainder of the tale as he'd attended the scene two hours earlier. The body fell out of the back of a moving van at midnight in a quiet residential area. One of the doors had obviously not been secured, and the body either rolled or slid, we think. It was wrapped in plastic sheeting. Cause of death was a fall. Did anyone get the license plate? Lively asked. Note the car behind was too busy avoiding the headless corpse that fell on the road in front of them, Graham explained. The driver was elderly and has been treated for shock, so we don't have much to go on at the moment. He didn't have a mobile and had to knock on doors until someone answered and called us. Who could someone like Finley have pissed off sufficiently to end up like this? 
Ava asked. You'll have to give me the day to get out there and talk to some people. The field of candidates is pretty limited unless he tried to extend his area of operations outside of Edinburgh, but Finlay knew better than to set up on another player's turf. Maybe there's someone new we haven't heard about yet. Whoever it is can't get the help, if they forgot to lock the van doors, Eva said. And the work is clumsy. It should have been obvious we'd make a DNA identification if he has multiple arrests on his record, the pathologist joined in. Aye, well, chances are whoever cut off the wee head wants word to get out. A couple of days delay just to make sure all the evidence is squared away, but after that there's value in making sure no one else makes whatever mistakes Finlay made. Sends a message. God, I'm never going to get back to sleep now. I might as well start making some calls. If I leave it until word gets out, it'll be like getting blood out of a stone. You're still not getting double time, you know that, right? Ava said. Finlay bloody Wilson's dead. I'd work for free today, if I had to. It's like a Christmas bonus. He rang off. I need forensic results as soon as your computer can run them, Ava told the pathologist. If it costs extra... MIT will foot the bill. I refuse to believe it's coincidence that Finley Wilson's bodies turned up the same week three other corpses are turned into pig food, when we've got the Gene Oldman case still open. Get me something I can work with. Are you going to release a statement for the press? Graham asked. I think that can wait a while. I'm in no rush for the decapitation jokes to start up again. Do you know how much street vendors made, selling funny T-shirts the last time we found a body without a head? A killing? the deputy pathologist offered quietly as he washed his hands in a corner sink. Ava glared at him, considered an answer and decided not to bother. Mortuary humour at 3.30am she could do without. Ava sat in Pax Graham's car in the mortuary car park. There was a conversation she needed to have. It was bad timing considering the bodies that were piling up and that she needed to dash back to Natasha's to check on her friend, newly returned from the hospital, but it was her mess, and she needed to clean it up. Any movement on the Jean Oldman murder? She stalled. We've got blood drips outside on the path. We're assuming the woman was still bleeding when she left the property. It trails off pretty quickly, though. The DNA is good quality. Doesn't help progress the investigation. Still no information from anyone locally. No one liked the victim but no one had any obvious reason for killing him. What's more interesting is what the woman was doing in his house. The fact that every single neighbour says they heard nothing and saw nothing means that they almost certainly did. Did the bullet that killed him come back as a match for a weapon used in any other offence? No. How's the Malcolm Riley investigation going in France? Slowly, Ava said. My gut's telling me that Bart Campbell has met the same fate, but there's not one piece of hard evidence to back that up yet. They both had meetings with a woman who might have been married or pretending to be. Then they each disappeared. We can't get a clear picture of her other than thin and pretty with long brown hair. CCTV has a possible candidate leaving Malcolm Riley's gym, but she was careful to avert her face, if it's the right person. She wasn't a member, but could have signed in as a day guest, using false ID and paying cash. We keep hitting walls. Have we hit a wall too? he asked, too fast for Ava to prepare for the bluntness of the question at that hour. Yes, she responded. It was brutal, but easier that way. She'd taken advantage of him, the least he was owed was honesty. For now or for good? The latter, she said. I'd say sorry, only that doesn't really do it justice. You'd be within your rights to make an official complaint. I wouldn't fight it. As I recall, I pestered you to go out with me, bought you drinks all evening, invited myself back to your place and kissed you first. I think it's fair to say that any complaint I make that my superior officer seduced me might be met with a fair amount of disbelief. I think I'd feel better if you could just be a bit of a shit for a few minutes she said. You think I'm going to let you off that lightly? She shook her head, staring out at the sleet. It was freezing. Finley Wilson had chosen a grim night to die. Will it affect how you feel about working in MIT? 
I don't want to lose you, but you should know that you get nothing but the best recommendation from me if you decide you've had enough. I applied to MIT to work with the best officers in Police Scotland, primarily you, not because you're sexy or funny or to get you into bed. Is it so hard to believe that I want to carry on working with one of the most respected chief inspectors on the force? If it is, you need to have a think about your self-perception. So, you're going to torture me by being nice, make me feel like even more of a jerk. Is that the strategy? That, and I'll be taking my shirt off at every given opportunity. No harm in reminding you what you've rejected. She opened his car door and slid out, leaning down to make herself heard against the howling winds. It's not about you, or your rank, or the complications of work. There's someone I'm not over, and I lied to myself about it. I used you. I feel crap about it. That's a lot of honesty, he said. Don't be too hard on yourself. I realised what you were going through, and I still went to bed with you. I just hoped I might be enough to make you forget him. You knew? Yeah, he said, turning the engine over. You called me a look twice that evening. You didn't even realise you'd done it. I'll see you at the station later. Drive carefully. The roads are treacherous. Ava stood in the car park a while, wondering why her face was burning when it was being pelted with icy rain. Chapter 24 Alex, the security guard, greeted Kalanach warmly at the door and immediately offered to get him a coffee. Kalanach accepted, wandering over to the machine with him and making small talk. Alex Quint, twenty-six years of age, had a clean driving licence and no criminal convictions. His parents came from Marseille, and he'd moved to Paris two years earlier, registering his address for voting purposes at that time. His mother was a chef, and his father, now retired, had worked for a wine wholesaler. His only sibling, a sister, was studying modern languages, the classic French family. It had taken all of thirty minutes for Interpol to turn up the information from a combination of official records and social media. Alex Quint had worked other security jobs before this one, always for decent amounts of time, for some well-respected companies. He was never going to be a CEO or set the world on fire, but he did seem to be that rare millennial, someone who had no selfies whatsoever on their online profile. Kalanach liked him all the more for it. So, who's your appointment with today? Alex asked. Bruno Plouf, Kalanach said. I met him yesterday. He seemed nice. We have to call him Dr. Bruno, as if he was a TV doctor, you know? The patients seem to like him, though. No complaints? Kalanach grinned. Only I'd rather have a heads up. Depends what you're in for. I'm guessing the hypnotherapy patients can't remember if it was actually helpful or not, he laughed. An administrator appeared from a doorway and called Kalanach's name. Hey, take it easy. See you afterwards. Sure, and thanks for the coffee. Kalanach gave him a wave and followed as directed into a corridor, then into another room. There was no sign of Bruno Plouf, so Kalanach made himself comfortable in a huge chair that made him feel as if he was drowning in cushion. The room was being scented from a lit bowl that was changing colour and releasing a soft mist into the air. Dimmed lights made the room homely rather than clinical, and there was a soundtrack playing so low he had to actively listen to hear it properly. Waves crashed on some imaginary beach and birds cried out to their mates. Every now and then a gust of wind sailed across the room, and branches rustled in a forest that was presumably carpeted with expanses of bluebells. Kalanach reminded himself of just how ill he was supposed to be. Bruno Plouffe appeared five minutes later, just as Kalanach was beginning to feel sleepy. Welcome, Bruno said. I'm so glad we decided to give this a try. I think we can offer you some real emotional respite. 
He took an armchair at Kalanach's side, making himself comfortable. We don't record conversations or make notes. My focus will be on you the whole time. This is a confidential environment, so you can say or ask anything you like. Our only request is that you are honest with us. It's difficult to help when our clients try to put on a front or to keep us at arm's length. That's fine, Kalanach said. The ambient soundtrack had turned into a ticking clock, and it seemed to be slowing down, more like a heartbeat. Or perhaps it had been that all along. It was hard to stay focused. I thought we'd try some hypnotherapy as a starter, Bruno continued. And please, don't worry about this. It's nothing like they make you believe on the television. You won't end up doing chicken impressions in the supermarket when the clock strikes twelve. In fact, you won't lose consciousness at all, and you'll remain in control of the situation throughout. Nothing we do here is aimed at uncovering new information or accessing parts of your memory that might naturally be inaccessible. Our purpose is to allow you to take better control of your mind, to manage those moments where you feel stressed and panicked, and to find a happy place you can return to whenever you need it. It's more like brain training than creating new pathways. Bruno leaned forward slightly keeping his voice low and even as he spoke. He touched a dial on a remote control at his side, and the lights dimmed further. Feel free to close your eyes, and we'll begin. You shouldn't have to concentrate on keeping them closed. Everything should feel natural and relaxed. I'm going to count down slowly from ten. So all you have to do is relax. All right? Kalanak said. His own voice sounded distant to him now, and he realized the heartbeat he could hear was his own, regular and slow, dependable, safe. He felt completely safe. My name is Luke Chevote, he reminded himself, suddenly alarmed at how much he might give away during hypnosis. He should have researched it better, he realized. His breathing was slowing and deepening in response to Bruno's commands, even though he could no longer really hear them. There was a series of questions he was supposed to answer with a single word as quickly as possible, all about emotions, how he felt in certain situations, how he felt when he was alone, with family, at the hospital, as he went to sleep, when he woke up. He fought to try to give the answers he thought he should in the circumstances and given his cover story, but he'd already reacted before he could find the most appropriate response. Then Bruno was asking him about other times in his life when he'd felt scared, and times he'd been truly happy. He heard himself say Ava's name, hoped he hadn't given the context. Then there was a floating white space, and he knew he was supposed to be meditating. A picture grew around him, element by element, as if he were painting it himself. Only he was in the middle of it, too. A pretend god, building his own three-dimensional world. There was a winding road, and hills rising up around him. An expanse of water, greater than a river, surrounding a building. Not just any building, it was a castle, with a bridge to the land. The sun was setting, leaving a blood-red sea beneath blackening silhouettes. He was sitting on a wall, his feet dangling over seaweed-strewn boulders, watching birds feasting on flying insects, and hearing nothing. Then hands covered his eyes, fingers warm despite the chill of the air, brushing his eyelashes, the touch so soft it was silk on his skin. Laughter. He turned around, and the scene reset to white and began to build itself again, over and over, until finally the laughter became a man's voice, and he was being told to come back into the room, back into the present. He didn't want to. The place he'd found, the moment he'd constructed, was idyllic. He was happy there, truly 
happy. Content. He wanted to hide there among the rocks, never to be pulled back. He resented the man who was calling him, tried to tell him he wanted to be left alone. Then there was a chair beneath him, the sound of a clock ticking, more light in his eyes. Bruno Plouffe touched his hand fleetingly. Kalanach opened his eyes. He took a few moments to ground himself. It's normal to feel a little disorientated, Bruno explained. Don't rush. You were very engaged. Some people are naturally more receptive to being hypnotized. Such a positive quality. It suggests an openness of spirit. Kalanach looked at the clock. He'd entered the room forty minutes earlier. The time had simply evaporated. So, we've established a safe place for you. Somewhere you can always access for a sense of calm and well-being. Do you remember it? I do, Kalanak said, trying to sit up, fighting the vast comfort of the chair. He knew exactly where he'd been in his mind. Aileen Donan Castle had been one of his first trips away from Edinburgh with Ava. They'd taken fishing rods and stayed in a hotel at Inverashiel. It had rained on and off all weekend. They'd eaten fish and chips doused in a lethal amount of vinegar and salt and drunk Glenmorangy from Ava's hip flask. They'd sat and waited for the sun to set at Aileen Donan, the other tourists disappearing around them as the day had worn itself out. And Ava had sneaked up behind him, covering his eyes with her fingers, as if it could have been anyone else but her, laughing at her own silliness. That was his happy place. He'd had no idea just how deeply ingrained the image was in his memory until he'd been instructed to go looking for it. Is there anything you want to tell me? Bruno Plouffe asked. I mean, anything I don't already know about your situation? Sorry, I don't understand, Kalanach replied. He hoped he didn't understand. Plouffe was giving him a quizzical look that might all too easily translate into revelations that Kalanach wasn't ill at all, and that his entire persona was, in fact, a fiction. Forgive me, I just got the impression from some of the answers you gave me that the stresses in your life rather predate the point in time of your diagnosis. There were moments when you were showing a remarkable resilience to your current situation, a much greater positivity than you talked about yesterday. It's as if your inner thoughts are at odds with the external you. Does that make any sense? Not really, Kalanach lied. I haven't been getting much sleep, and my emotions have been very up and down. It's probably just a reflection of that. So how does hypnotherapy work? Is there something I need to do to trigger a particular response, or is it automatic? No, it's not about programming at that level. It's much more about putting you in touch with a version of you that's beyond your illness. What we find is that when people become chronically ill, or when they're given a diagnosis of a terminal illness, they often get swallowed up. They become completely defined by it. Their former interests and achievements almost cease to exist. It's important to locate times and places beyond a diagnosis or a prognosis that more accurately define and reflect the whole individual. All I've done today is help you bring a particular memory to the forefront of your mind, encapsulated it in the present, and established it as a coping mechanism. It won't so much spring into your mind unwanted, as it will occur to you as something that will help when necessary. It's still your image to build and decide to use. I certainly feel more relaxed already, Kalanak smiled. So, where do we go from here? I think some counselling sessions might be helpful. Your needs and emotions change as your physical treatment progresses, so it's useful to have a place to come and unload. We recommend one session per week, and you can always add additional time when you need it. Also, do consider attending our social events. Get to know some of our regular clients. 
there's a wine tasting tomorrow evening if you're free with soft options for people undergoing treatment that conflicts with alcohol. Also, many of our clients benefit from using the massage or aromatherapy services. Just coming to unwind is an equally valid use of the center. Tomorrow night sounds good, Kalnach said. I'll book in. And thanks for this. It's good to have made a start on coming to terms with what's happening to my body. Indeed. I should warn you that a small number of patients experience strange dreams the first night after a hypnotherapy session. It's nothing to be concerned about. Sometimes it's just the deep relaxation opening up doors that have been closed a while. Any concerns, feel free to phone in. Kalanak excused himself and walked out into the foyer with the odd sensation that he wasn't fully clothed or that he had forgotten to do something important. His mobile buzzed in his pocket and he reached inside to divert the call to voicemail. He wasn't ready to talk to anyone just yet. Hey, you okay? Alex asked. You look a little out of it. Yeah, feels like I just had a long sleep. That's all. Have you ever tried that? No, I'm way too cynical. I'm not sure it would work on me. I don't fancy having an audience. I'd be sure to dribble or snore or something. He gave a short smile, then caught himself, reddening. I mean, not that I think you did. Ah, oh, man, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. You were there for a reason, and all those people were in there trying to help you. I wasn't making light of it. All what people? Kalanach asked. Well, obviously, Dr. Bruno, but Lucille Blaze, who you met yesterday, and one of the physical therapists, I forget his name, they went in fifteen minutes or so after you and came out a few minutes ago. Did you? He trailed off, looking towards the administration area window and dropping his voice a few volume levels. Did you not realize? You sure it was the room I was in? Kalanach asked. Sure. I was right opposite. The staff room is across the corridor. I was filling my timesheet for this month. Look, I didn't mean to say anything, and I shouldn't have talked about Dr. Bruno's sessions at all. The important thing is that it might help you. I need some water, Kalanak said. I'm feeling a bit shaky. Sit down, Alex said quickly. I'll bring you a cup. He fussed with the water fountain for a minute, before returning with a half-full paper cup. Thanks, Kalanak said, taking a sip. Does that sort of thing happen often? People who work here wandering into each other's sessions? He kept his eyes on the cup. No big deal, just making conversation. I really can't, you know. They wouldn't like it if I talked about the central. There's a confidentiality thing we sign. Well, that's about the patients, right? It's good to know everyone takes that seriously. I was asking about the staff, though. I read some reviews online from a couple of patients who were concerned their details had been passed on and how they were being offered treatments that weren't suitable for them. I just want to know that this is the right place for me. It's important, especially if I'm running out of time. He let the rest of the sentence hang. Don't say that. Alex took the seat next to Kalanax. Most of the staff here are excellent. Not that I've had treatment as such. I just know by the way they talk about the patients and their work, how much they care. Most of the stuff. Alex didn't answer the question. You've got good doctors at the hospital, right? Other professionals to advise you? Why? Alex, is something bothering you? No. What do I know? 
I watch the door, call cabs for people and show everyone where to get coffee or water. That's my whole job and I like working here. He began fiddling with his name badge. Kalanak knew Alex was a closed door for the day. Well, I'm glad you work here. A smiling face is a rarity in places like this. I've been invited to some wine-tasting evening tomorrow. You're going to be on the door. I don't really want to come if I don't know anyone at all. Certainly, Alex said, standing up again, his grin back in place. I can even introduce you to a few other people. You should definitely come. I will, Kalanak said. My phone's buzzing. I better take it. He gave Alex a goodbye nod and walked out onto the street, taking his phone out. Voicemail message delivery kicked on. Hello, this is a message for Detective Inspector Kalanach. I hope I have the correct number. Your details were passed to me by a boy currently under arrest. His little sister is here too. My name is Annette Thomas from Child Services. Could you give me a call back urgently, please? The children are Azat and Husnia. They've declined to give us their surnames at present. She left a number at the end of the message that Kalanak wrote on the back of his hand. For a few seconds, he'd had no idea who the woman was talking about. It seemed like an age ago now that he and Jean-Paul had searched the location where Malcolm Riley's body had been left. He'd given the two Afghan children his card. The brother had to be pretty desperate if the only adult contact they had in Paris was him. He thought of the girl crying and hiding behind the bins, hungry. Seconds later, he had child services on the phone. Two minutes after that, he was in a cab, on his way to talk local police out of charging his art with a burglary that could mean prison time and losing contact with his sister for long enough to hurt them both. Chapter 25 Anyway, it turns out, lively announced to the audience gathered around him in the incident room, that Finlay Wilson had been spending a substantial amount of time in Wester Hills. Suffice it to say, no one I spoke to was the least bit concerned to hear the wee bastard had passed. Someone actually thanked me for letting them know, and that was a first. Any information on Wilson's most recent rocket, then? D.I. Graham asked. Pimpin, apparently. He's been involved before. Mostly small time, not quite standing on street corners, negotiating his working fees. But nothing very sophisticated. Maybe if we can find some of the women he was running, they'll be able to shed light on who he'd made an enemy of recently, Eva suggested. Perhaps it was one of the prostitutes that did it, DC Swift offered. Sex workers, Eva corrected him. You think one of these toms went to the trouble of cutting off his head and hands, gift-wrapping him, lifting him into a van, then driving around the city with him, rolling around in the back, rather than just emptying his pockets, fleeing the scene, and going to the nearest pub to get good and pissed in celebration? Lively asked, arms crossed, shaking his head. Do the letters DC in front of your name stand for doesn't concentrate? All right, Sergeant, that's enough, Eva butted in. We need to speak with any known associates of Wilson's. If he was running girls on the street, regular patrols should know about it. If not, he's got a base somewhere. Phone records? Not that chance, Lively said. He was an evil little git, but he wasn't stupid. There won't be a phone contact in his name. More likely he was using burners. Track down Wilson's family. Find out where he was living. Any vehicles registered to him. Perhaps you could make a start on that, Constable Swift. Eva offered as a lifeline, before he became forever known as doesn't concentrate, although she realised it was probably too late already. What's maybe more interesting is the fact that one of my sources has confirmed that Finlay Wilson and Jean Oldman knew each other. Makes sense. If Wilson was hanging around Wester Hills a lot, but Oldman isn't exactly a likely candidate for an associate of Wilson's. By reputation, he was something of a hermit, and certainly not a tough guy. Lively reached out for the last ageing donut that had somehow been left uneaten in a box from the local supermarket. Eva heard the crunch as he bit into it and winced. What about the young woman whose footprint was found in Oldman's house and the blood outside? She mused. 
Perhaps Finley was keeping his workers off the streets and offering a home delivery service. Less chance of being stopped by the police, he could control the price, send one of his men with each woman to collect the money, so he was never going to be ripped off or shortchanged. Still doesn't give us a suspect. Oldman couldn't have killed Finley. The deaths are in the wrong order, Graham said. Maybe it was a rival pimp. It's possible that Finley started running his business on someone else's patch, Lively said, mouth still full of stale dough. Work that as a theory. I want a list of anyone known or suspected of organising prostitution in the city. Speak with the deputy pathologist and scene examination team, would you, D.I. Graham? Let them know we want to double-check for any overlap between Finley Wilson and Jean Oldman. Wilson's footprints or DNA in Oldman's house... Make sure the footprint on Oldman's floor wasn't Finley's, as unlikely as it seems. At present, we're assuming the footprint belonged to a female, but Wilson was only five foot four tall. And find his head and hands. That's a story someone will be itching to tell after a few pints. She stood up and walked to the wall that held endless photos of Malcolm Riley, together with maps of his last known movements and the out-of-focus likeness of the woman he was believed to have met at the gym. Right. D.I. Kalanak is working on a lead in the Riley murder that's led into a clinic in Paris. It looks as if someone was offering to use healthy organs as some form of cure, presumably to people with chronic illnesses who could get their hands on the right amount of cash. If that's right, it means that the operation has been carefully set up, streamlined and financed. After going to that much trouble, it seems unlikely that they'll stop at selling just one set of organs. What are they going to do with a mum, if not transplants? someone asked. We don't have the answer to that yet. There's a suggestion of a more alchemistic element to it. Myrrh was burned and found as a residue in Malcolm's hair, and the wounds suggest a level of anatomical knowledge but little surgical skill. As a witchcraft? Swift asked. It's a con, Ava replied firmly. There's no such thing as witchcraft. There are, however, plenty of extremely vulnerable people out there who'll do literally anything to survive, and for cranks and charlatans they're easy prey. Alternative therapies with no sound medical basis are being offered for tens of thousands of pounds. Globally, this is a multi-million dollar industry. Take a quick look at crowdfunding, and you'll see endless supposed breakthrough remedies being promoted. Eva had looked and spent much more time on the variety of websites offering seemingly miracle cures than she'd intended. Natasha was still in the early stages of treatment, with the best medical team supporting her, and even so, it was difficult not to get caught up in the brilliantly marketed, utterly convincing scams that promised natural therapies that worked with the body's own immune system to fight the disease. The options were mind-bending, and all came complete with financial advice for those who might need to liberate some cash from their home to pay for the chance to survive that they'd been persuaded their current doctors were somehow conspiring to keep from them. She moved across to Bart Campbell's section of the board. The woman who spoke with Bart in the restaurant as he finished his shift matches the general description of the woman Malcolm Riley was seeing. But I doubt if that's what she looks like now. Her hair might be shorter or a different colour. She might have coloured lenses in or be using different clothing and padding to alter her body shape. What does seem unlikely is that Bart met this woman for the first time that evening and agreed to hook up with her. That doesn't fit with what we know about him. So we need to investigate further back on his timeline. It might give us more detail about where they met, possibly alternative CCTV footage. Maybe one of his college friends spoke to her at some point. Or perhaps he dropped her name into a conversation. Bart's mother says she has a very open relationship with her son, especially since the death of his father. She pointed at a printout of a faded colour photo on the board that showed a man in uniform holding a baby boy. So it seems entirely possible that Bart was strongly urged to keep the relationship a secret, which is the main link between our two cases at the moment. Except for that photo, Swift piped up. Every head turned. Sorry, which photo? Ava asked him. The one with his dad there. It's been all over Facebook, that one. I knew I'd seen it somewhere before when it got pinned to the board in here, but I hadn't put two and two together until now. There was a long silence while they collectively waited for Swift to explain himself. He didn't. Are you saying that someone has shared this photo on Facebook to promote the search for Bart? 
Eva asked gently. His mother, perhaps? No, it wasn't that. Hold on, it'll come to me. Lively jolted in his chair, and Eva put a firm hand on his shoulder to keep him in place. That's it. It wasn't Facebook at all. It was Twitter. You know like those things when some kiddie loses their teddy bear at a train station and someone picks it up and takes a photo of it. They tag it like, Please share. This lost bear was found this morning at Waverley Station. Let's see if we can't help find its way home. What the fuck are you? Lively began. Hold on. Eva murmured in his direction. Constable... Are you saying that someone else found this photo and has no idea of the connection to Bart Campbell? That's right, Swift grinned. Ava realised there was only so long she was going to be able to prevent Lively from bursting into an act of physical violence that would require an internal investigation to be held, not to mention probable criminal charges. So what did the message with the photo actually say? she asked. No idea. Swift replied, eyes wide. I couldn't understand a word of it. I never learned French. Every chair scraped at once. Every computer screen was prompted into life. Social media filled the room, all bright colours and gifts. Find it right now, Ava ordered, and make sure we get a completely accurate translation of the page. Source the original media post, then get Interpol on the phone. I'll call D.I. Karanach. Got it. D.I. Graham shouted across the den. Ava scooted between chairs and bodies to see the screen. There it was. A photograph of a photograph, curled at the edges, tatty from years of being carried in a pocket, taken out frequently and admired. Next to it was a second photo, this time of the back, and the handwritten but legible message, Bart, I may not always be by your side, but I will always come back to you. Love, Dad? Kiss, kiss, kiss. That's definitely the original, Ava said. The copy on our board is from a scan Mrs. Campbell took of the photo in case it ever got lost. Apparently, Bart had it in his pocket at all times as a way of keeping his father with him. She told us about the message on the back, but it hadn't been released to the media. Mrs. Campbell was adamant about keeping it private. Below the two images, someone had already made the effort to translate the original message. It had been found on the ground in a car park outside the town of Arras, close to where the A1 road ran south to Paris. Map, Ava said. The screen changed to an overall view of Paris, then zoomed in closer and closer until the road system around Arras could be seen. Here, she said, pointing at one particular junction. He had that photo on him. His mother said he transferred it morning and night to whatever trousers he was wearing. They'd have checked for his phone and wallet, but this would have been easy to miss. Or they just might not have been bothered about it. He left us breadcrumbs. So, how did he get there with no passport? Graham asked. Ava put one finger on the map and followed the road system north. She stopped at Calais. So they could have driven down through England with him hidden in the boot, then taken either the Channel Tunnel or a car ferry to France. Risky, though. Several opportunities for him to be found, either banging the trunk at petrol stations or passing through customs, Graham concluded. Unless they sedated him, Ava said. It might have been a truck rather than a car, so better soundproofed and easy enough to get him out of the country. The real risk would have been a random vehicle search on arrival in France. Private boat, Graham suggested. Would have made it easier to have pulled up in a cove somewhere without customs. Expensive and more risky. If they'd been spotted by a customs vessel, they'd have had little chance of hiding him once they'd been boarded, Ava said. Notify Interpol that we need the person who posted this interviewed immediately. Establish a timeline and details of that specific location's weather. Let's see what the state of the photo was when it was found. Maybe we can figure out how long it had been there. It's been doing the rounds on Twitter a few days now, Swift added. If that helps... Sack him, Lively whispered in Ava's ear. Please, for me. Hey, he just got the only lead in a case that no one else has made any substantial progress in for days. If you're not careful, I'll end up promoting him, she said, dialing Kalanach's mobile. 
You wouldn't dare. Eva looked across to where the detective constable was grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, maybe not, she said, as Kalanak's voicemail message kicked in. Luke, we've identified a photo of Bart Campbell with his father that he always carried with him. It looks like he tried a Hansel and Gretel tactic. I'm emailing you a precise map, and we're contacting Interpol HQ to get officers to the person who found it. It means the theory is confirmed. Bart is on French soil. It seems likely he went through Calais, but there's no support for that as yet. If someone has taken Riley and now Campbell, they might have others, or be planning more abductions. Phone me as soon as you get this to update me from your end. I suspect Bart's running low on time. Chapter 26 There was a table and a universe between them. Azat had greeted Kalanach with an angry glare. His little sister, Hasnia, was in a nearby room, wrapped in a huge furry blanket and playing with a box of second-hand toys. Child services were doing what they could, but without Azat's cooperation, that wasn't very much. Are you going to talk to me? Kalanach asked the teenager. I only gave your name because I knew you were a cop. It stops them from charging me, the boy announced. That might have worked for an hour or two, but it won't stop the police completely. Your sister's fine, by the way. She's been given food and a hot drink. They want a doctor to take a look at her, but that's just standard practice when a child comes in who's been living on the streets. We weren't on the streets, Azad hissed. I take care of her. We were inside a building. With furniture and electricity? Some were safe that no one else had access to? No answer. Listen, it's clear you love Hosnia, and that she loves you, but you have to realize the position you're in. If you're charged, you can be tried at fifteen, and if you're found guilty, one option is that you'll be kept in a young offender's institution. In those circumstances, Hosnia will be placed with foster carers, or in a home and no one will be able to guarantee if or when you will be housed together again. More silence. But Azat's lower lip was less steady than before. Tell me about this burglary. Why were you there? It wasn't a house. It was a warehouse where lorries pick up boxes of food to take to shops. I figured I'd just get some supplies to keep us going. We'd run out of money, and it doesn't hurt if it's a big supermarket. They throw so much away. It's safer just to go through the bins at the end of the night when the food shops close. Only Hasnia got sick last time we did that. I wanted to make sure what I fed her was safe. They're making a fuss over nothing. You broke a window and got in by climbing on top of the parked vehicle? Kalanach asked. He'd been given a brief summary of the details when he'd arrived. Azat shrugged. So? So someone's going to have to pay for the damage. Most of these big companies have a zero-tolerance policy on prosecuting. They have to keep their workforce safe. You left a large patch of broken glass on the warehouse floor. Someone could have got hurt. Doesn't it matter that we're going to starve to death if we don't eat? Of course it does. I'm just explaining to you why this isn't being dealt with by a simple warning. You're old enough to know better. Have you tried any of the homeless shelters? They often have hot food, at least soup. That's fine for me, but as soon as they see Hasnia, they start making phone calls. Then people turn up and try to take her away from me. I promised I'd never let that happen. Okay, I'm here and I'm listening. What is it you want me to do? Kalanach asked. Stop them from charging me. Get them to let us go. You said you'd help. Are you a liar too? Actually, I asked you for information, and I gave you money to get food. My phone number was there in case you suddenly remembered anything that might help me. A social worker entered, carrying a fast food carton. The smell of hot salt made Kalanach hungry. Azat grabbed it as if he were starving. Kalanak saw that his arms were stick thin as he reached for a packet of ketchup to smother on the fries, and his hair was matted. 
Kalanak waited until the boy had consumed everything in front of him. If you could help me, give me some information about how that body came to be at the building site, I could use that to persuade the prosecutor to drop the burglary case against you. I should have known you were going to use the situation to get something for yourself. That's the only reason you came. Azat licked the last of his meal from his fingers. Kalanach took his time responding. This is serious, Azat, he said. I'm not here to argue or negotiate, not because I don't want to help you. I intend to do everything I can for you and your sister, but turning information over to me isn't optional. A young man is dead. He was brutally murdered, and he was only a few years older than you. If you know anything at all, you have to tell me. Do you know how many dead bodies I've seen? I was twelve when we left Afghanistan. By then, they were already gathering any boy over the age of ten to fight for one side or the other. They took my father. Then my mother sent us here with some men she paid all her savings to just to keep me alive and to stop Hosnia from being promised for marriage by some male relative once my father died. Hosnia can't remember it, but I do. Men who refused to join whichever army came to their village first had their eyes burned with pokers, or they were pushed off buildings. We don't even know if our mother is alive or dead. There's no way of contacting her. That might be something else I can help with. Interpol has a worldwide intelligence network. We'll need details, name, date of birth, the town she was last seen in, any place she has relatives and the people you think might have her. He finished quietly. Azat was right. Kalanach had no idea what the boy had seen, or just how tough his short life had been so far. Now here they were, living in a foreign country without security, without even the basics to keep them safe and well. Give me a moment, Kalanach said. Leaving the room, he sought out the arresting officer, it took fifteen minutes to ensure that no charges would be brought, and an offer to personally make good the damage to the warehouse window to guarantee that the owners wouldn't make a complaint. He went back to Azat, then took him through to his sister. They sat on the floor together, Azat admiring the way she'd set all the toys out in a row and kissing the back of her head tenderly when she told him the names she'd given the stuffed animals she'd found. Kalanak was impressed. In spite of all they'd been through, Azat had combined being a brother with being a stand-in parent, making ends meet, and improvising to keep them both fed. If he'd had to steal along the way, then who could blame him? Now, I'm going to liaise with child services to make sure you're placed together. I understand, after all you've been through, that it's vital you're not separated. Hosnia would suffer if she was taken from you. Azat gave him a look that was largely suspicion, with a dawning element of hope. You have to be careful to comply, in the future, with France's laws. I don't live here all the time, and the next time you get in trouble, I might not be able to help out, so no more stealing, okay? The boy gave a single brief nod. Hasnia needs you with her, not locked in a cell. You did a good job, Hazat. You got her all the way from Afghanistan, and you kept her safe. But she needs proper food, access to doctors, and a warm bed to sleep in. It's time for you to let others help. Immigration services will make sure you're allowed to stay here for as long as it's not safe for you to go home. Kalanak bent down, picked up a small puppy toy, and waved it at Hasnia. You'll be all right now, he told her. You can trust these people. Make sure your big brother reads you bedtime stories, okay? The little girl gave a smile that would have broken the hardest of hearts. Kalanach felt a pain in his chest at the thought of all she'd experienced. If there was any natural justice, her mother would be found, and they would be reunited as soon as possible. Kalanach exchanged a few quiet words with the social worker, who was making notes in a corner of the room asking to be notified when the children were placed and contacted if there was any difficulty in ensuring they were kept together. 
As he put his hand on the doorknob to leave, he felt a hand on his shoulder. That's it? Azat asked. No strings? You want nothing in return? I want to know what you saw at the building site. I need to find that boy's murderers and keep other people safe from them. But you were right. I should never have seized the moment to get something from you. If you're going to help me, it has to be voluntary. Not least because anything you tell me has to be real and true, not just so that I do you a favor in return. Azat stared at his trainers quietly for a few seconds. There was a van, he said. White, old. Its bumper was coming off. At the building site? Kalanak asked. Yes. What were you doing there so late at night? Shouldn't you have been looking after Husnia? Azat frowned. I was getting money to buy her breakfast. One of my friends was looking out for her that night. Our gang was given a few euros a week to watch the building site and to call the boss if we noticed anything. He didn't want to pay for proper security while no work was getting done. But they had a lot of machines and building supplies there. He knew it was our turf, so he offered us the money if we didn't screw him over and break in ourselves. Different people in our group took turns hanging there at night. Three of us were watching when the van turned up. It was dirty, old dirt, like it hadn't been washed for a year. And there were no words or pictures on it, but there was this one area that was bright white, in the shape of a large leaf. Kalanak looked at the social worker, poised with pen and paper. May I? he asked. She held both out to him. He handed the drawing materials over to Azat, returned the paper landscape, and drew a rough outline of a generic van. Along it, filling about one-third of the van's side area, he drew a large leaf, tipped as if it was falling in a breeze, not yet landed, stock dipping towards the bottom of the van. This is the best I can draw it, he said, passing the paper to Kalanach. There was no mistaking the shape. It's like they'd just taken a big sticker off the van, so that area hadn't had a chance to get dirty yet? That's really helpful, Azat, Kalanak said. Thank you. What about the people from the van? Can you describe them? It was dark and they were dressed in black. They were both men, quite tall, but they had big coats on and hats, so I didn't see their faces clearly. They were white, though. I could see from the backs of their necks. Could you hear them talking? We were too far away to hear anything, and there was music from the floor below us. We were in the high-rise building, in the corridor that runs along the outside. They just pulled the van up, took something, the body, but I didn't know that then, into the building site, then came out and left. Quickly, though, they didn't hang around. You didn't see the license plate? No. So, did you ever call the boss to report what you'd seen? Azad shrugged. No. I mean, we were there to stop thefts or vandalism, you know? Those men dropped something off. They didn't steal anything. We made sure they didn't have anything with them when they came out, so we figured they hadn't done anything wrong, and... He stopped talking. And what? One of them had a gun over his shoulder. A big one. Semi-automatic, I guess. I was getting ten euros for the night and I had Hasnia to think about. I wasn't going to get involved with the sort of men who carry weapons like that. The others felt the same. Nothing was stolen, no harm done. Better to keep quiet. If I'd known... You couldn't possibly have known. And you were right to think of Hasnia first. It wasn't your responsibility, Azat, Kalanak said. We didn't know you were police when we first started throwing bricks at you and the other man. We thought you were there to steal, Azat offered quietly. I would never have done that. I believe you. You know, Interpol needs agents like you. Men who understand how the world works who want to make it a better place, who's responsible enough to keep a little girl safe, even when it feels impossible. 
Azat pulled back his slumped shoulders and drew himself up taller. The smile on his face was priceless. Really? Really? Kalanak replied. You've already learned a second language fluently. You're fit and strong, and you're never going to have a criminal record, right? The boy grinned wider. So get yourself to school and work hard. Whatever has happened in your life so far doesn't have to define your future. The boy was against his chest in a moment. The hug, so brief, Kalanak hadn't the opportunity to return it. Hasnia beamed a smile at the two of them. Kalanak figured he couldn't beat that for an outcome, said his goodbyes, and left. Chapter 27 The intended dinner was a burned mess in the frying pan. Ava glared at it as if the food had left itself unattended, then dumped it in the bin. I'm getting dinner delivered, she shouted into Natasha's hallway. Is Chinese okay? Sure, Natasha shouted back. Nothing too spicy for me. My stomach's not up to it. What's that smell? Sorry, can't talk. I'm on the phone, Ava replied, pulling her mobile from her bag. Natasha appeared in the doorway. Home cooking. You should go on one of those food shows. Master Chef? Eva asked, punching a number into the dial pad and swearing at the screen. No, I meant one of those programs about nightmare kitchens, where they do a sort of forensic investigation and discover that if you'd eaten there you'd have died from some awful bacteria. Natasha laughed. Here, use my phone. There's an app that lets you order online without calling. She passed it over. You're supposed to be sitting down and taking it easy, Ava said, as she scrolled through food images and a price list. I'm supposed to be married with kids, watching soap operas and deciding where to go on holiday this year. Unfortunately, I'm gay, easily bored in relationships, prefer horror movies, and have cancer, so my holiday this year is most likely to be spent in a chemotherapy unit. Want to get into an argument with me? Just grateful that you're so good at taking advice, Ava noted. I've ordered. It'll be twenty minutes. Will you at least sit down and let me make your delicious green tea? In lieu of a vodka and tonic? She took a seat, and Eva put the kettle on. Have you heard from Luke? We've had some progress in the case he's working on. He's busy and his partner was hurt on duty, so there's a lot of pressure on him at the moment. We're mainly communicating through voicemail or email. But you spoke to him at the airport, right? It's just that you haven't mentioned him since? It's all fine, so there's nothing to tell you. Whatever misunderstanding we had has been put aside. He's worried about you, obviously, and has demanded regular updates. Natasha yawned, throwing her head back and making a whining noise in the back of her throat. God, you're exhausted. You should have said. Look, why don't you go and lie on the couch? I put a blanket there already. If you fall asleep, I'll wake you up when... Oh, no... Sorry, I'm not tired at all. I'm just incredibly bored of listening to your bullshit. But go ahead, I interrupted, which was rude. Eva put her hands on her hips. Do you suppose it's more serious to assault a cancer patient? I mean, would a judge give me a longer sentence for, say, giving you a black eye now rather than before you were diagnosed? At least then I might be interested in you again. It's almost worth the swelling. Natasha laughed. Fuck you, Eva said. And after I cooked you dinner. You cremated dinner? It was a cruel and unusual act performed on innocent protein and carbohydrates. Ava slumped in the chair opposite Natasha and ran her nails along a scratch in the wood. We're good friends, Ava said. He's come to terms with that. It was all terribly grown up and clinical, so there you go. He's over me, which is exactly what I deserved. Probably best. As what you don't know is that I got drunk to an extent that I can only call reprehensible and slept with another of my detective inspectors. Just saying it out loud makes me feel queasy. Natasha stared at her, mouth open for full dramatic effect. Go on, say something, let it all out. I'm going to settle in for at least thirty minutes of piss-taking. She folded her arms. Natasha let the silence hang for another thirty seconds. I'm not bored anymore, 
she said eventually. Eva leaned forward and banged her head on the table. I'm a disgrace, she groaned. If it helps, I prefer you disgraceful to dull. Tasha! Okay, okay. I know you feel like crap. It's written all over your face, and it's not an attractive look. Eva scowled at her. Was the detective inspector a man or a woman? Only if you finally came to your senses and switched over for a bit of female action, I think that would be perfectly sensible. Eva picked up a tea towel and lobbed it across the table, unable to stop herself from laughing. Whatever you did, it's not the end of the world, Natasha said, more gently. You weren't seeing anyone. You certainly weren't seeing Luke. You should probably try to limit your work conquests to, say, not all the officers who rank immediately below you in your squad. She paused, and Eva allowed her to giggle at her own joke for a while. But I'm not sure what you think you've done wrong. You mean apart from making things bloody awkward at work? Or using a really nice guy who the majority of women would be delighted to wake up with? Or maybe behaving like I'm a student, instead of a supposedly responsible member of society who's mature, thoughtful and trustworthy. Hmm, let me see. Do you ever allow for the fact that you're human, and therefore occasionally imperfect? I shouldn't even be thinking about this stuff. I have... Shit, I've actually lost count of the number of dead bodies in the mortuary at the moment. It's that bad. Another missing man, barely even a man and quite possibly more on the way. When I think about Luke, or Pax, I feel like I'm being selfish, like my life should stop, or that my personal experiences should mean less to me. And it does pale in comparison to the lives that have been lost, or that are hanging in the balance, but just sometimes I'd like to be able to feel sorry for myself, or make plans, and think about what I really want. When I try to do any of that, I just feel guilty. Natasha reached across the table, laying both her hands on top of Eva's and squeezing. I know that, she said. You're the most on-duty person I've ever met. It's like you get dissolved by your work. But you need to remember that being human makes you a better police officer. Having a personal life, understanding the mechanics of relationships, being able to comprehend loss, fury, envy, exhaustion, grief, making mistakes, for God's sake. If you didn't do those things, and feel those things, how could you possibly have the psychological roadmap you need to guide you in your job? So give your guilt the night off. I'm ordering you. Talk to me about how you're feeling, and what you're going through, without comparing the pettiness of your woes to everyone else's. You matter, Ava. Not just to me, or to your family, but to the whole community. To Edinburgh, if you want to think about it like that. You need the space to decide what will make you happy. That doesn't change because of what's waiting on your desk tomorrow morning. Eva coughed and dashed at her eyes with the back of her sleeve. You know, it's worse when you're nice to me. I know. I love that. Natasha smiled. So start with this, just for me, because I'm not sure when the hell I'm going to have sex next. How was it? Honestly, I can't remember. Not that I'd share, even if I could. But there was beer, then cocktails, then there was whiskey, and a bit more whiskey, some whiskey chasers. You're sure you actually had sex? We woke up in bed together naked, and he seems to remember it vividly, so the possibility that we got into bed together and fell asleep without doing anything is not a life raft I'm going to persuade myself to cling to at this point. He's not the problem. In fact, he's been more than decent about it. He said, Eva huffed and frowned at the table. He said I called him Luke twice during the evening, and I hadn't even realised I'd done it. Then he said he shouldn't have gone to bed with me knowing how I felt about another man. Knowing you're in love with another man, Natasha corrected her. Am I? I don't know any more. I think I've spent so many years avoiding relationships that my tendency towards self-destructing when anyone gets close to me isn't a defence mechanism anymore, it's just me. I'm not a pessimist, so why can't I see a future for myself, where I'm in a happy, stable relationship? I had my chance with Luke, and I blew it. Or we both blew it. 
if I'm being fair to myself. I'm out of energy, Natasha. I have no idea what I want. But as a philosopher, I can tell you that most human beings move forward only by realizing what they don't want, rather than by experiencing a sudden revelation about what they're actually looking for. Think about it like this: When you took Luke to the airport and started that conversation with him, what did you really want to say to him? What's the fantasy, ideal, dream version of his response? That's what you want. Whether or not it's what you need right now is a different thing. Now, are you going to make that tea, or are you expecting me to do that myself? Because I thought you'd come round to be helpful. Bugger! Sorry. Eva stood up and began pouring boiling water over tea leaves. Isn't what I want the same thing as what I need? Not necessarily. Quite often in life, not at all. Humans have terrible judgment. Examples: What I want is wine. What my body needs is water. What I want is a cream egg. What I need is broccoli. What I want is to sleep until eleven a.m. What I need is to get up and fill my tax return. The two things are quite often at odds with one another. Eva put the teapot and a mug on the table, then started getting out plates and cutlery. But those are practical examples. You're talking about physical or legal requirements. My problem is about how I feel and what I see in my future. Is it? At the risk of you not being terribly careful with that knife you're carrying, I see it like this: What you wanted was for Luke to declare his love for you, to take responsibility for everything that went wrong between you, to let you off the hook, and to move things forward in a way that meant you didn't have to address your own emotional shortcomings. What you need, lower the cutlery, is to understand why you constantly destroy your chances of personal fulfillment by choosing the wrong men. Why can you operate like a clinical sharpshooting goddess at work, but not express a single intimate emotion to a man in your personal life? What you needed to do with Luke was to have the guts to express how you feel about him at the risk of him still rejecting you, because if you don't think he's worth the risk of getting hurt, then how can you possibly deserve him? The doorbell played a few jingly notes. Wow, I've never been literally saved by a bell before. Who knew? Eva dumped the cutlery on the table and made for the door. By the time she returned, Natasha had poured her a large glass of red wine and was lighting a candle. You think I'm a coward? Eva asked. I think you can't do your job, spend eighteen-hour days seeing the very worst humanity has to offer. Toughen up so you don't get broken by everything you deal with, and not have that impact on your ability to be open and responsive to your personal life and emotional needs. Are you going to withhold food from me because you're annoyed? Because if you do, I should tell you I'm finding someone else to play nursemaid in the future. Eva put the cartons down on the table and began opening them and dumping messy mounds of noodles on plates. I didn't tell Luke how I felt about him, because I didn't want to put him under any pressure. That wouldn't have been fair. Bollocks," Natasha said, tucking into her food. "Could you maybe go a little easier on me? I'm in the middle of you're in the middle of what you're always in the middle of, and it's never going to stop as long as you're still doing your job. I, on the other hand, am in the middle of trying not to fucking die. You have my opinion. Nothing more. Accepted, rejected, whatever you want. Right now, if you don't shut up and eat, I'm kicking you out. Shit." Eva said quietly. "Yeah, sorry, I was warned I'd have bursts of anger. Could you get the soy sauce out of the cupboard above the sink?" Eva fetched it. "I love you," she said, handing it over. "I love you too," Natasha said, cramming food into her mouth. "God, either I can't stomach the thought of food, or it's like I'm pregnant with sex tuplets." Eva's mobile rang as she was swallowing her first mouthful of wine. "Mum, it's lively. Need you in the incident room right now. Hope it's not a bad time." "I'm coming." Eva hung up. She shoveled several forks of food into her mouth before standing up and dragging on her coat. "Don't say it." "What?" Natasha grinned. "Don't. Just eating my dinner. Nothing to see here." "I know my work-life balance is screwed." 
Ava grabbed her car keys and walked to the back door. You haven't got any shoes on. Oh, for crying out loud. Ava stormed back into the hallway. I'll see you later. She opened the door again. Thanks for dinner. The door slammed. Chapter 28 The deputy pathologist was huddled in a corner of the incident room with D.S. Lively and D.I. Graham when Ava arrived. The room was remarkably full given the time of night, presumably because it was so unlike Lively to call an off-duty meeting that everyone was curious as to what couldn't wait until the next day. We've established a connection between the Gene Oldman killing and Finlay Wilson's death, Lively began. I'm going to ask the deputy pathologist to bring you all up to speed first. The presentation screen lit up with photos showing the floor of Gene Oldman's kitchen and the pathway outside his house. Several areas were marked with photoshopped arrows. You'll be familiar with the partial footprint inside Oldman's house, he began. There were also blood droplets found outside the property on the pathway shown. We obtained DNA from this blood, but have not found a match for it on the National Database. The screen went dark momentarily, lighting up again with a photo of what remained of Finlay Wilson's body. There were a few groans from the audience. It was too late at night to be looking at a headless corpse, Ava thought. The body was brought in with hands and head severed post-mortem, still not recovered. Cause of death was internal bleeding after a fall, which in turn caused his heart to stop beating. We performed urgent complete swabs for DNA as well as fingerprinting the whole surface of the skin and checking for unusual fibres that might tell us where the body had been stored. We rushed the results through. He gave Ava a brief glance that she hoped wasn't accusatory. And we did find another person's DNA. He hit another button on his laptop and the image changed again to a close-up of Wilson's penis. That time there were retching noises, a round of expletives, and some improv comedy. Could they not have cut that off as well? Someone yelled. Did he cut off his own head in disappointment? That's all you get, Ava said. Back to business. Please do carry on. We found clusters of cells here. He pointed on the screen at the base of the penis, in the pubic hair and more under the foreskin. The placement of the cells indicated that they had been deposited during sexual intercourse. It must have been reasonably soon prior to death, as there is a fair amount of bodily fluid still on the corpse, including the deceased's own semen dried onto his stomach. All of this would have been reduced with friction against clothing or washing, even urination had much time passed. It's not possible to draw up a more accurate timeline than that before anyone asks. We checked the cell type. These were vaginal or cervical cells with a full DNA structure. Again, the police database did not come back with a hit. That drew a few disappointed sighs. The deputy pathologist raised a hand. Bear with me. After that, we ran a DNA check against all the other bodies recently processed who were deemed to have been victims of crime, given the sudden and unusual influx of bodies into the mortuary. I can tell you that the DNA from the blood found at Gene Oldman's is an exact match for the cervical cell's DNA on Finlay Wilson's body. So, she was present immediately before or during Oldman's death, and again soon before and possibly at Wilson's death, Lively said, which means she's either the killer or our best witness. Are we looking for one of Finlay's sex workers, then? Graham asked. That's the most likely scenario, Lively said. And it would explain her being at Oldman's house if Wilson had his women doing home visits. I made some calls when this evidence came through. Since word has begun to spread that Wilson's dead, the residents of Wester Hills are marginally less tight-lipped than they were when Oldman was killed. Word is, Wilson was running girls out of a number of flats across the city. No one's quite sure of the scale of it. One hundred quid got us the address of the block of flats Friendly was known to use closest to where Oldman lived. Interestingly, they're all rented flats. 
Not one single resident is claiming benefits, which is unusual for that area, and I can't contact any of the flat owners. Cash paid, no questions asked. As no one who's renting out the flats is suspected of involvement in a crime, we can't bring them in under arrest. Can we not just break down doors and do a sweep, see what we pick up? DC Swift asked. Aye, we could, but then no one will talk. Word will get out, the killer will hear about it, and the broader investigation will be ruined, Lively replied, softly but firmly. Ava was put in mind of a man training a very young puppy not to pee on the carpet. Do you see? Oh, I get it, Swift said. Well done, Lively said quickly. I want to get someone in there undercover first to figure out what's going on. We need some more information. The addresses of all the flats. Names of Wilson's associates and enemies. See if anyone knows anything about Oldman. It's no good solving these murders if we don't have the physical evidence to put the perpetrators away for life, Eva said. So, we need someone who has a deep understanding of how this community works, the case themselves, and the instincts to uncover the story without jeopardising the investigation, Graham said. And who's believable in the context of using sex workers. Eva added. There was a silence so long it was easy to imagine a dust ball being blown across the incident room floor. Almost without noticing the tide of movement, all eyes were on lively. You posy of pricks, he said. That's ageist. I can complain to HR about this. It's not ageist if it's because you're a grumpy old git, Sarge, DC Monroe called out. The room erupted into applause. Sorry, Sergeant, but you know this case, the local area, and all the key players better than anyone else on the squad. Ava tried to quell her smile. Has anyone been inside the block of flats in question yet? All we know about it is that it's four floors, two flats front and back in each block. Front main entrance, but a fire escape at the back. Some of the windows seem to be permanently blacked out. Is the top floor high enough for loss of life if a man was pushed over the handrail? Eva directed at the pathologist. Four floors is high enough to cause the injuries Wilson sustained. It's survivable in some cases, but it would depend how you landed. However far Wilson fell, he landed on his back and his spinal injuries were severe. I'd say the geography of this property makes it a possible scene of crime. Then start on the top floor, as that's more likely where Finley was pushed from. Get into a room alone with one of the girls. Careful how you go about it. We can't risk an obvious wire. Choose someone mature. We don't want the complications of you ending up in a room with anyone underage who starts stripping off. Pay them extra. Tell them you're lonely and that you just want to talk. Finley's dead, so we need to know who's in charge now. Offer them witness protection, a guarantee of no prosecution, but if they have information, they'll need to give evidence in court. The information might be useless. Yes, Mum, Lively scowled. Anything else? Do I need to tell you to keep your clothes on? Lively folded his arms and stared at her. Right, it's 8.45 now, so let's work towards getting you in there at 11 this evening. Lively, you'll need a name of someone local who recommended you. If a stranger turns up out of the blue, they'll be suspicious straight away. Why don't I say I heard about it from Gene Oldman before he died? We found betting slips in Oldman's belongings. I can put together a backstory about using the same bookie. Great, Ava said. Contact the tech team about getting us ears inside with no prospect of your cover being blown. And we'll need backup as close as we can, but not inside the block. If this is a professional operation, they'll have a man posted on security all night. What do you want to do about a weapon? Knife in my boot. If they do a body search, that'll be perfectly normal for Wester Hills. It'd probably look more suspicious if I wasn't carrying a blade, to be honest. Agreed, Ava said. Let's get moving. I want the building plans obtained from the council, a full layout, better information about the occupants of each flat, and eyes on both building entrances all day today to get a feel for who's coming and going. Photos of every single person seen entering and leaving, with control room working up identifications in real time and building up profiles. Sergeant Lively, a word in the corridor? He followed her out. I'll have to approve the operation with the detective superintendent. Did you want to talk to her first? 
It was an uncomfortable conversation to have. Until it had come to a recent halt, Lively and Detective Superintendent Overbeck had been having an extramarital affair that had lasted several months. Ava had an unspoken agreement with Lively not to refer to it. He shrugged his shoulders. Doesn't matter either way, he said. I doubt she'll even register my name, to be honest. Oh, fine. I'll deal with the super then, Ava said. Are you... okay? I'm not sobbing on my sofa watching Bridget Jones movies, if that's what you're worrying about, he smirked. Ava figured she'd probed enough. All right. You're to brief me in person with all the security and tech arrangements. I'll be heading up the operation in the vicinity. You're sure this isn't too risky? I can find someone else. There's no pressure. And pass up my chance to be a hero. I figure this'll get me a few months free beers, and I've told all my old stories to death. I'll be fine, ma'am. You'd better be, you stubborn bastard, she said. Chapter 29 Fifty press-ups twice a day was his target. That, and staying on his feet, walking the perimeter of his room. If the opportunity came to escape, Bart had decided he wasn't going to get caught just because incarceration had left him unfit. He was at number 37 of his first set of the day, when the noise in the corridor marked an unusual amount of activity. It was neither meal nor shower time. He stood up and peered out into the corridor, holding his breath. The party detoured off into Sky's room. Two men and two women, all wearing surgical gowns. The first woman carried a kidney tray, its contents obscured by a sheet of paper across the top. One of the men was pulling a drip stand. Another woman was pushing a machine with a large monitor with a variety of leads snaking from it. The final entrant into the room carried a video camera in one hand and a bulky tripod under his other arm. Each of them was gloved. Mouths and noses covered by a mask, just as Sky had described it happened with Malcolm. Hey! Bart called out. Sky's door shut firmly. Hey! He shouted louder this time. Sky! Fight them! Just fight! He slammed a fist against the door. The sound echoed uselessly back at him. Use me instead! He yelled. Don't touch her, you bastards! Don't you fucking touch her! No one reacted. No one came. They could hear him, he was sure of that, but Skye didn't make a sound. She didn't race to the window to take one last look at him. No guard bothered to admonish him, because they were miles from anywhere, alone. Skye was all he had. The thought of being there without her was the death warrant of hope. He stood sentry at the glass in his door, watching as every now and again a gowned figure passed the window in Skye's room, turning, motioning, doing God knew what. He wished he could switch his imagination off. In the end, it took remarkably little time. An hour, he estimated. No more. Out they trailed, one after the other, pushing and pulling their equipment walking casually as if everything they'd done was perfectly normal, as if the woman in the room was a bona fide patient, not a kidnapping victim. There was no sense from their demeanour that they were ashamed of what they were doing or that they feared discovery. Bart pressed his face against the glass. There was no sound at all from Skye's room, only the ghost of her in his mind, standing at her door, pressing her fingers against the glass while he did the same holding hands in spite of the space between them. He gave up on the remaining press-ups and curled on his bed. Bart! Sky was whispering to him in his dreams. He turned his head into the pillow. Bart! Are you there? Please! Not in his head. The voice was coming from Sky's room. She was talking more slowly than usual and her voice was thick, low. He jumped from his bed and skidded to his window. She was there. The section of her face that he could see was even paler than normal, the ends of her fingertips glowing white dots against the pane. Thank God you're alive, I thought. I just... They didn't hurt me, she said. It was weird, but it wasn't bad. 
I just don't know. He paused. He heard the sob in her voice. I just don't know how much longer I've got now. Tell me everything. They set this camera up and told me to lie on the bed. I heard you telling me to fight and I wanted to, really, but there was no point, Mark. They said if I just lay still I'd be okay. They promised me. I didn't want it to hurt, whatever they were doing. That's okay, I was wrong. You did the right thing. I was an idiot, I panicked, don't listen to me. It wasn't fair to tell you to fight, I'm so sorry. She was crying. He cursed himself. All that matters is that you're okay now. Do you know what they wanted? They put this drip in my arm. I saw a bag with saline written on it, but they added another drug. I kind of fell asleep. I couldn't move or speak, but I could hear them. They set the camera up in the corner of the room. I remember seeing that. I think they took my clothes off, but by then everything was just fuzzy and my head felt blank. They dressed me again before they left. Anything else? Did you understand what they were saying to each other? The woman, the one who did most of the talking, spoke in French, and I have these weird lines on me. She broke off. Bart gave her a moment. What sort of lines? Pen markings, in a purplish felt tip, over my stomach, my back, although I can't see it all, round each of my breasts, some on my face. Can you see from there? He tried. It's not clear, he said. Do the marks make any sense? It's kind of like an anatomy drawing. There's a circle where my stomach would be, my liver, definitely my ovaries. Maybe they're just teaching with us. Maybe that's all this is. Do you think that could be it? Maybe they let Malcolm go after all. Her voice got brighter, bolder. They haven't hurt us yet. It could be some military thing, practising for an epidemic, you know, top secret. They'll explain it all to us when it's over. Bart said nothing. The hope in her voice was killing him. He knew it wouldn't end that way. So did she. Shit, she whispered. That's all right. We have no way of knowing what's going to happen. They did the same to Malcolm. Two days later he was gone. I have a mark. Her voice was muffled. Bart pressed his ear to the glass. Say again, he said. I said they didn't hurt me. It didn't hurt at the time, but it's starting to now. I have a pinprick in my thigh. Quite deep. It's not bleeding or anything, but it's bruised. Bart frowned. Think back, he said. What's the last thing you remember? It's not like there's a sequence. Her voice was tense. It's all just a muddle. Voices, images. I wanted to sleep just to let it all go. My body felt so heavy. One of my eyes opened on its own. Then there was a light like they were trying to look all the way into my brain. Probably just checking your level. That was it, she blurted. That's why my leg hurt. I felt it, but I didn't. I know that doesn't make any sense. I knew something was happening to me, but it wasn't painful then. Just a sense of intrusion. They stuck a pin in me. Do you think you flinched? Bart asked. I'm certain I didn't. Does it matter? It did, Bart thought. It mattered a lot. Whoever was destined to view the video needed to see Sky as unresponsive, perhaps even comatose. It was a sales video of some sort, and she was the goods. None of it matters, he said. People are looking for us. By now, your family will have figured out that you didn't just decide to leave. They'll be searching for you. My mum will have raised hell. Sooner or later, they'll figure out something that'll bring them to us. There's still time. Hey, what cocktail am I buying you at the newsroom? How many can you remember from the menu? I don't know, she said. I can't think. Yes, you can, he said. We've just arrived. It's busy, but we get the last table. It's a Friday night, or maybe a Saturday, but we both managed to get the night off work. 
The city is mad with stag parties. It's raining, but not too hard. I've got an umbrella, so you won't get too wet when we leave. My brother would like you. He could hear that she was trying to be brave, but her voice shook as she said it. Well, next time we'll invite your brother out too. He laughed. But tonight is just for us. Martini, she said. Nothing too sweet. With a green olive. In a tumbler, I don't like those wide V-shaped glasses. I knew that he said. They're too pretentious for you. Let's set the date. First weekend back in Edinburgh. I'll pick you up at eight o'clock. I'd like that, she said. Hold my hand. Bart pressed his fingers against the glass, grateful to stop talking for a while. His brain was too overwrought for him to speak coherently any longer. Over the course of his conversation with Skye, he'd made a single irreversible decision. The day she was taken, he would extract the loose metal screw that was sticking out of the plug socket in his wall and open up a vein in his wrist. He'd already done a dry run and made a scratch in the right place. Without Sky to stay strong for, to imagine freedom with, his continued existence was just too painful to contemplate. Chapter 30 The party was more upbeat than Kalanak had been expecting. The human spirit was naturally optimistic, he thought, but more resilient in public than in private. He wondered if the laughter would stop as soon as each attendee climbed into their car or cab, or if the ebullience would last longer, perhaps until they were in their own homes and safe to mourn their fates without feeling self-conscious. The thought made him want to call Natasha immediately. Luke! Alex said. Can I get you a drink? There are sodas or fruit juices. Must be tough to be around wine. I'm not sure arranging an evening based on an alcohol theme was the best idea here. It's Paris, Kalanak smiled. How many of us are really prepared to give up wine, even when we know what the consequences might be? True enough, Alex said. So what'll it be? Just a sparkling water. I guess that means I haven't given up hope yet, in spite of the prognosis. Desperation may be making me deluded. Is there really no other treatment? Treatment, but no cure. I'm too far down the transplant list to make that a viable option. Unless you've heard of something I don't know about. I wish, Alex murmured. Dr. Bruno tells everyone during our training sessions that no patient is ever beyond hope, that miracles happen, and that we should encourage all the patients to ask about options, no matter how hopeless it seems. He says there's no such thing as end game. Really? Sounds like that might give false hope. Alex shifted from one foot to another. Not that Dr. Bruno would do that deliberately, I'm sure, Kalanak added smoothly. He seems like a genuinely caring man. I'll get you that water, Alex said. Kalanak watched him go. He was going to have to work the room, make his plight known to as many people as possible, then wait and see if his efforts bore fruit. He couldn't approach Dr. Bruno and ask why Lucille Blaze had gone into his hypnotherapy session without making it obvious that someone had spoken out of turn. Yet the hypnotherapy wasn't supposed to leave him with a gap in his memory. Lucille herself was missing from the gathering, although there was nothing amiss about that. Staff members would have other commitments in the evenings. He made a mental note to schedule an appointment with her. It wouldn't be difficult to orchestrate a reason to do so. The clinic offered enough therapies that he could find endless questions about them all. Hi, a woman said, offering her hand and giving him a demure smile. Forty, he guessed. A French national, well-spoken with long auburn hair and an attention-grabbing figure. He shook it and smiled back, wondering if she was a patient or attending in a more professional capacity. She certainly didn't look ill. I'm Marie Delphine, she said. Luc Chevauté, he replied. I didn't want to leave you standing alone, 
She slid her arm through his. Come and meet some people with me. Kalanach turned to look for Alex, but there was no sign of him at the drinks table, or anywhere else in the room. He allowed himself to be led towards a small group of people in one corner. Apparently the networking was going to take care of itself. Two hours later, and he was no further forward. He'd exchanged details with two other patients suffering liver complaints, his conscience twinging at the extent of his lies. Bruno Plouffe had spoken to him briefly, welcoming him before moving on to other people eagerly awaiting his attention. Alex had brought his water after a while, apologising for the delay, checking Kalanak was all right. Other staff had made the effort to introduce themselves, some of whom had obviously read his file, while others hadn't. There was a system, one had explained. All staff were notified that a new patient was on the books, and his file could be accessed on their database for everyone to familiarise themselves in their own time. Marie was the clinic's marketing and public relations consultant, which explained her approach. She'd seemed to know almost everyone in the room, staff and patients alike. It was some sort of grant that paid for her time, although Kalanach guessed the clinic wasn't her only client, given the designer clothes and jewellery she'd been wearing. Using a bathroom break as an excuse, he sent a quick message to Interpol, listing all the names he could remember and asking for background checks. Back out in the main foyer, in the absence of any familiar faces, he focused on a notice board instead. A poster with a single green leaf logo at the bottom caught his eye. Kalanach pulled the pins from the corners and took a closer look. The leaf design was the same as Azat had claimed was on the van that had delivered Malcolm Riley's body to the building site, but this was in a vertical position, as if growing directly up from the earth. Are you a vegan? Laudable, but I'm afraid I'd struggle with it. I like steak tartare and loves the thermidor too much to make the sacrifice. Kalanak looked over his shoulder to see that Marie had found him again. I was looking at the logo, actually, he said. I thought I recognized it, but it must be a different brand. I'm not a vegan, though I've had to give up red meat since I was diagnosed, as well as a number of other things I used to love. Of course, Marie said. How insensitive of me. I'm in awe of the people who use this center. You all cover the pain of what you're going through so well. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to say I forget what you're dealing with. I'll take that as a compliment, Kalanach smiled. And you should forget. Who wants to walk around contemplating their mortality all the time? I know I don't. Marie smiled back. You're empty-handed, she said. Can I get you anything? I know you're not drinking alcohol, but maybe orange juice or water? Maybe just some help, given your expertise in marketing. Is there somewhere I can find a particular logo? I have a vague image of it in my head, but I can't quite remember the company it belongs to. What product was it advertising? That would be the best place to start. Pharmaceutical? Food or beauty? Just a category would get you started. I'm afraid I'm not sure. Sorry, that's not much help, is it? Kalanak said. Not to worry. Do you have an image of it somewhere you could scan? There are some great image recognition apps around on the internet. Sadly, I don't. It's a leaf like this one, but on its side. I'm not quite sure about the color of it. Pretty wide brief, right? It's one of those universal symbols. Food is the most obvious product type, like the poster you're holding. But nature symbols can be helpful in lots of different marketing situations. Promoting medicines you want the public to think of as pure, but which are really just a cocktail of chemicals. Makeup and beauty products that would make you rethink your need to be beautiful if you knew what was in them. It's the oldest trick in the book. Got a rotten product? You need consumers to think of as natural? Use a sunflower, or a leaf, a water droplet, or a ladybird as a logo. Buyer sees the logo. The words that will spring into their mind are things like unprocessed, organic, safe, pure, wholesome, unrefined. I could go on. 
have whole files of buzzwords relating to images that show what consumers respond to? So don't be fooled by the leaf, is what I'm saying. The product the brand is selling is as likely to be an opioid as it is your vegan burger there. She pointed at the image on the poster. Thank you, he said. I'm not sure what for. I certainly haven't limited the field for you. Food for thought, anyway. Possibly just not vegan. Marie laughed. The evening seems to be winding down, he said, looking at the dwindling numbers left in the room. I should probably make a move, too. Of course. She extended a delicate hand for him to shake once again. As he took it, he found a business card left in his palm. In case you want more help with your logo research, Marie said. Or anything else. It was nice meeting you, Luc Chevotet. Likewise, he said, slipping her card in his pocket. She gave him a last smile and slipped off towards a small group still chatting in one corner. Kalarak disappeared out of the door, unable to find Alex to say goodbye. He walked a while before taking a cab, thinking about what Marie had said. Logos weren't always what they seemed. He'd been thinking too literally about what sort of company might have owned the van that had dropped off Malcolm Riley's corpse. He needed to cast the net much wider. An hour later he was back at his hotel, staring blankly at his computer screen. The enthusiasm he'd felt when he'd first sat down to begin researching, a distant memory. Marie had been right about the scope of the leaf image. Leaf logos cropped up in every industry imaginable. Even limiting the search to companies based in or around Paris, the possibilities were vast. It was another dead end. Chapter 31 Elenuta sighed. It was eleven-fifteen, and her night's work had barely begun. Who knew how many more men would parade through the door? She stared at the wall. The last man had ripped her clothes in some sort of show of bravado. He must have been trying to impress himself, because he couldn't possibly have thought she was going to be impressed by it. Now there was both screwing and sewing on the agenda before she could sleep. She brushed her hair. Some of the other women were letting theirs get matted. Elenuta understood the temptation. Make yourself unattractive, hope you got chosen by fewer men. What those women didn't understand was the jeopardy they were in. Less attractive meant you were more disposable, and that took you right up to the threshold of being selected for the race. A living hell, or a brutal early death. What a choice. Things had been bad under Finlay. She hated how literal that was. But it was even worse with Scalp in charge. One of the girls had a barn on her neck after forgetting the electrical circuit and sticking her head through the front door to shout downstairs. It was only then that Scalp's goons had realised what a great punishment it made, particularly in moments of boredom. One of the women answers you back, or refuses you a quick blowjob, Throw her out of the door. Pull her back in. Throw her out again. Next time, she'll comply quicker. Just when they'd all thought life couldn't get any worse. The walkie-talkie buzzed. Two men were on their way up. Scalp kept a man on the external door these days. Finlay had never bothered, which was the only reason she'd been able to escape. No chance of that now. Elenuta did her best to pull her clothes together and make herself presentable again before opening the door and parading herself in the hallway as instructed. She was exhausted. It occurred to her that if she put her head in and out of the front door enough times she might actually die. For the first time, that seemed like an acceptable choice. Jacket off, shut open. One of the guards told the men at the door. Come on! You know me, I'm here all the time, one of them groaned. Elenuta recognised him as a regular. New management, new rules, the guard said. Do it, or go the fuck home. The other man complied, slipping his arms from his jacket and opening the buttons of his shirt to show his chest and stomach. Empty your pockets, 
the guard told him. He took his mobile and a set of car keys from him, and a wallet from the other. The guard gave it a half-hearted check. First time? Aye, the man said. Gene Oldman gave me the heads up. I don't mind paying in advance, but I'm not leaving my wallet out here for some little bastard to scam me. Gene Oldman's not recommending anyone anymore. Way I heard that the miserable sod blew his own brains out, and now the police are looking to pin it on someone local to make themselves look good, bunch of wankers. Surprised they haven't knocked on my door yet, the new man said, with a broad grin. The guard laughed. Leave your phone, take your wallet with you, but watch the bitches, they'll try anything. Payment's due now. How many girls? Just one. Any preferences? The law do whatever you want, mind. Any problems, just give a shout. Can I get a better look at them? He asked, moving further into the corridor. I want that one. The second man in pointed at the woman to Eleanor's right. I'm here all the time, I should get first choice. Forty. The guard held out a hand. Once the bundle of notes was passed over, the other man looked up and down the row of women. I'll need someone who speaks a language, the man said. I've got some instructions, but I don't want to have to draw fucking diagrams. Her, or her. The guard pointed first to Elenuta, then to one of the younger girls. The new man looked at them both, long and hard. That one, he said, indicating Elenuta. I've got a teenage daughter. I don't need another one rolling their friggin' eyes at me and sulking. Leave her in a fit state to work the rest of the night, otherwise you're good to go. Thirty on a first visit. Consider it an incentive to come back. That should better be fucking amazing, the man grumbled, handing over the cash. If she's no, she'll be explaining why to the boss. What did you say your name was? Jack Thompson. Jackie and my friends. But let's wait and see how your hoe does before we get too pally. I'm Paddy. The man extended his hand, and they shook. Off you go then. Half an hour. Anything over that, you get charged extra. Elenita watched as the man plodded towards her along the corridor. Caucasian, hairline receding as his stomach expanded, he looked out of shape and sad. She supposed she should be grateful she'd make her quota of jobs for the night. Popularity kept her safe from the prospect of being forced into the race, but she so wanted to lie down and rest, just for a while. Come in, she said, standing back and letting him through her door. He walked in and went to the window as she closed the door behind them. Does that lock? he asked. No, but not worry. They only come if you shout. It's private. I undress, or you do it? What's your name? the man asked. Rosie, she lied. None of them were supposed to use their real names. On bed? No, but you can sit down if you like. Keep your clothes on. What's your real name? She stared at him. You're not Scottish. Your English is good, but not fluent. It seems unlikely that you're called Rosie. Where are you from? Elenuta perched on the edge of the bed, studying the stranger. Most likely it was Scalp, testing her out. It was exactly the bastard's style, gets her to break the rules as an excuse to punish, making it easier to ensure the other women's compliance. Glasgow, she said. I have to do work. What do you want? I'm not really in the mood, but don't worry. I'll make sure they know you did everything I asked. No, she stood up. I work hard. I do what told, whatever you say. She looked towards the door. One of Scalp's men would be on the other side, listening, ready to report back. The man followed the direction of her glance, walking across the room, then sitting down on the floor, his back to the door. There was no way anyone was going to walk in. On the bed, he ordered loudly. Right now? Elenuta sat down again. And get naked. She began doing as she was told but he covered the space between himself and the bed on his hands and knees in a couple of seconds, holding her hands still and shaking his head. Don't, he whispered. It's all right. I'm not here to hurt you. You can trust me. 
He returned to his original position, keeping the door firmly shut. What's that around your neck? Elenuta rubbed her eyes. Electric, she said. There's a boundary. She nodded. There was no point lying about the dog collar. The large battery unit attached to it made the purpose obvious enough. So you're not allowed out of here? She shrugged. She didn't really see the point of the conversation. You're not living here voluntarily. You pay to ask questions. That a problem? He asked. I get trouble, she said. Not okay to talk. I guess that, he said. So who's the boss here? Ward was getting around about that, so she supposed she was allowed to answer. Scalp, she said quietly. Scalp? That's a new one on me. Does Scalp have a surname that you know of? She shook her head. Did Scalp put that thing around your neck? She nodded. Motherfucker, he muttered. Come here, she hesitated. Right now, come and sit on the floor with me. Elenita sighed. This, she understood. Men giving her orders. It was easier than answering questions. She braced herself for whatever was coming. He kicked his boots off, reaching inside one of them and taking out a penknife, flicking the blade open with his thumbnail. Not hurt me, she flinched, throwing herself backwards. Oh, God, I'm an idiot. I should have explained. I won't hurt you, not at all. Let me sort that thing out. I won't take it off you. They'll never know. You can just say it doesn't work. Better still, if you go across the boundary, just act like you had a shock. She frowned at him. What? I'm going to disable the battery unit so you can't get an electric shock, he whispered slowly. Eleonita looked him up and down. He had no intention of having sex with her, that much was clear. His clothes were clean, his nails neatly trimmed. His voice was kind. Either she shouted for help, which would likely get her nothing but fists for dinner, or she could trust, which was something of a joke. She'd thought she was beyond such overt stupidity. On the other hand, a knife to the neck would at least be fast. She leaned forward again, presenting the right side of her neck where the battery box was, closing her eyes. Relax, he said. I'll be careful. He inserted the tip of the blade into the battery box and took out the screw. Turn a bit more left. She opened her eyes, getting a better look at his face as he worked. Hold your hair back for me. She did. She could hear scraping. His arm made a tiny sawing action in front of her face, then his elbow banged into her nose. He stopped what he was doing and leaned back. Sorry about that. He smiled. You okay? She couldn't resist a laugh. Half embarrassed, half intrigued at how worried he looked. If a bump to the nose was the worst of her problems, life would be wonderful. Is okay, she said. All right, I've nearly got it. I just don't want to do any damage to the outside, or they'll notice. This way, you can claim you know nothing about it. They punish me anyway, she said, as he picked up the tiny screw and closed the battery unit back up again. I bet they bloody well, he said. There. I don't suggest you put it to the test, but I reckon that'll keep you a bit safer. He folded the knife blade away and reached for his boot pausing before he secreted it. Do you have anywhere safe you could keep this without getting caught? She stared, assessing its length, then went to a set of drawers and took out a pair of tatty jeans. He held the penknife out to her. Her hands shook as she grasped it. She'd have liked the time to have sat and stared at it, but no such luxury existed. She wiggled her finger into the hem of her jeans and tucked the blade into it, manoeuvring until it was the opposite side of the hem from the small hole. Why give me a knife? she asked, as she put the jeans back in the drawer. Just in case. I'm guessing you need to protect yourself. If things ever get really bad, 
better to have something. And so you understand that I'm here to help you. You believe me now? She thought about it. It could all have been a set-up from the minute he'd walked into the flat. New customer, making sure the guards followed procedure, asking questions she wasn't supposed to answer, naming Jean Oldman as his source of information. Ellen Utah had cautioned herself not to react to that. Not that it affected her. She was glad the man was dead after he'd helped Finlay find her. It would have to be a pretty elaborate hoax, though, disabling her electric collar, giving her the knife. Scalp was devious and manipulative, but he was also arrogant. He wouldn't have wasted so much time and energy on her. Easier to have just beaten her to a pulp to see if she was properly broken in for him. I believe, she nodded. My name is El Nuta. They kidnapped me. Bring me here from Romania. He reached out his hand, waiting until she put her own much smaller one in his, then shook it gently and released her again. Lively, he said. Detective Sergeant Lively, Elenuta. I'm a policeman. Do you understand? The air left the room. She stifled a laugh at the absurdity of it, felt the dizzying effect of adrenaline as the truth hit her. He was police. She could see it now, in his demeanour, his confidence, the way he spoke to her. And yet she was still shut in a room, still a prisoner, and he was arming her for her own good. Why you not arrest men? she asked. You mean the men out there right now? she nodded. I want to leave. Now they hurt us, rape us. You help us leave. I'm going to, he said. I just need some help from you first. Would you sit down, Elenuta? Tell me what I need to know, and we'll talk about getting you out of here. Now there were tears in her eyes. Every single day she thought she was beyond crying. Something new happened to prove to her that she was still human. Usually it was an act of brutality or cruelty. Now this. The tantalising closeness of freedom, of safety, even a glimpse of something that smelled curiously like fresh-cut grass and that tasted like justice. And yet it was still about making a bargain still just out of her reach. Of course it was. Escape was a mirage in the desert. She sat down next to him, her back against the door alongside his, as she stared at the blacked-out window that she could break, if she liked, and jumped to her death when she'd really had enough. She sighed. What do you want to know? She asked him. Finlay Wilson. Lively said, his voice much quieter now, one ear to the door. Have you heard that name before? He was boss here before Scarp, she said. Very bad. Well, he's dead. We're trying to find out who killed him. Do you know anything about that? She closed her eyes. Every word she said got her farther into a situation that would undoubtedly end her. Only it was too late now to go back and she found that she didn't really want to. Scalp kill him. Take over. You know that for certain? Lively asked. I saw. The throw of... She pointed towards the hallway. What word? Railing? Lively asked. Yes, over railing. They argue. Scalp angry about money. I saw. You actually witnessed it? Elenuta nodded. Did you, sorry to ask this, did you see anyone do anything else with the body after that? No, they shut the door. Scalp's men cleared up, I think. Well, that was easier than I thought, Lively said. Were there any other witnesses, anyone who could say the same thing in court? Many women here, we all see, to scare us, understand? I do, and I'm sorry to ask about this. We know from Finlay's body that he had sex with someone just before he died. You don't happen to remember which of the women here he'd been with. The rush of nausea Elenuta felt was overwhelming. She could smell Finlay's body odour, feel the roughness of his fingers on her skin. Every drop of sweat from his body 
had reeked of hatred. Okay, Lively said gently. That's okay, lean forward, take deep breaths. Is nothing, she said. Funny shade of green for nothing. He went to the bed and picked up a pillow, bringing it back for her to lean against. So it was you? Yes, how you know? Apart from your reaction, he smiled. You're the prettiest woman in this place. Not just here. You'd be the prettiest woman in lots of places. I'm sorry, this may be the worst time in ever for paying someone a compliment. Better than a slip, she smiled back. I knew Finlay a bit, from way back and by reputation more recently. If he had to choose a woman from here, it was obvious it would have been you. In which case... I have to ask you something else. Another man died recently, Jean Oldman, a couple of minutes' walk from here. He was shot in the head, she finished. I escaped, ran, knocked door for help, but Finlay came. Who shot him? Finlay's man. Jean made him angry. How did you cut your foot? Lively asked. Glass from door. Can I leave with you today? There are other police officers outside. They know about this place and what goes on here. If you're willing to give evidence to help us find the man who shot Gene Oldman, we can shut these flats down straight away. We'll find this scalp. If need be, we'll make sure you get protection before and after the trial. How soon you find scalp? She asked. I doubt you'll manage to avoid us for more than a week. We'll be able to figure out who his contacts are, where all the other women are being kept. You not know? Not yet. It was only because Finlay died that some of Jean Oldman's contacts told me about this place. Sooner or later, we'll build up the bigger picture. And then we'll... But next race is tomorrow night. Must stop it. She was raising her voice. Lively put a gentle finger over her lips, pressing his ear to the door and waiting before he responded. What race, Elanuta, I don't understand. Race, girls and men. Finley started, scalp to same. Like a running race, or something else. No, no, in big room, big building. Women run, men go after. If they catch, they kill. Must stop it. She gripped his arm. More women die. More? When? Hold on. How many women have died already? Were you there? She shook her head and released her aching fingers from his forearm. I'm not there. Finley show me on computer. Three women die. One live. She race again. Do you know what happened to the bodies of those three women? No, she whispered. I think I might, he said. This was recently, in the last couple of weeks. Yes, Scalp was there. Other men watch. How many men do you think? Maybe one hundred. Not sure, but many. All bad. All bad, he agreed. Were all the women in that race taken from the flats in this building? No, from different places. i never seen those women before. You must find others before race. Yeah, he said. We must. Lively folded his arms and stared at his feet. Elenuta watched him struggling for words and realised what the issue was. Arrest men today, scalp will hear, and maybe you not find all women, she said calmly. Yes? We'll have to get you out of here. What you're going through? Scalp will be at race. All bad men and guards. They tell where all women are. Many women, I think. A fist hammered the door. Elenuta shrieked, jumping towards the safety of Lively's arms. Nearly finished, he shouted. Time's up, pal, Paddy the guard replied. Then I'll fucking pay for a bit more. Now we just sawed off while I do what I'm here for. Lively had his hand on the doorknob. His weight pressed against it for good measure. Elenuta held her breath. 
All right, but it'll be another twenty for the extra minutes. You good for that? And then some. Lively growled. Footsteps up the corridor indicated that the deal was done. Elenuta collapsed against his shoulder. I can't leave you here. You're being raped, all of you, beaten, tortured. One more day. You find race. This stops for everyone. I can't do that. Lively said, "It's too dangerous. If we could just get Finley's computer, we'd have the evidence. Maybe we'd get the other addresses he was keeping the girls at. We'd find out which men he'd invited to this race." Scalp. She tried to find the word and couldn't, making a violent motion with her foot instead, like this on laptop. Stamped on it. She nodded, completely destroyed it, and take away. She said, "All papers." Everything. Police, watch here. Tomorrow, guards go to race. Only one guard stays here. You catch all bad men. No women hurt. You save us. She took his forearm in her hands, clutching hard. Lively shook his head. There's no guarantee that if we don't find them or something goes wrong, must try. She said simply. The hammering at the door began again. They both stood up. I'll get you out of here, one way or another. Will you be okay tonight? I need to go and brief my boss. He whispered. I will, she said. Lively took an awkward half step towards her, then backed away. Elenuta covered the distance herself, reaching up to hug him, wishing he didn't have to go. He felt so solid and real. She just wanted to cling to him. I have to go. They'll get suspicious. Quickly, loosen your clothing. He whispered. She undid her shirt and the top button of her shorts, messing her hair up for good measure. I'm coming back, Elenuta. You're not alone any more. The door opened. She gave a new shirt. Paddy asked, just telling her what I'm expecting next time I see her. Lively said, "You got my phone there." Here you go," he handed it over. "She all right then?" "Aye, one's the same as another once they're on their backs, right? To be honest with you, I guess a bit boring after a while. Do you not offer anything more exciting here? You can have multiple girls as long as you pay. The boss doesn't care, and he turns a blind eye to what you do to them as long as they're fit to work the rest of the night. If I want to give a woman a slap, I'll do that at home where I don't have to pay for it." Lively got a bit closer to Paddy, dropping his voice and giving him a wink. Gene Oldman told me Finley used to run something a bit more exotic. Said he could never afford to go, but cash isn't a problem for me. Gene was a twat with a mouth that got him killed. Paddy said. Not going to disagree with you about his mouth, but his ears worked fine, and he heard stuff. Listen. He stuck his hand in his wallet. I get it. These things only work if the people involved know how to keep their mouths shut. I appreciate your discretion, as a matter of fact, but I can pay, not just whatever it costs to get in, but as a thank you to anyone good enough to help me. He shoved a roll of twenties into Paddy's hand. If you could help me out, there'd be double that in it for you. No one else needs to know. Paddy looked up and down the corridor before answering. It's not that easy. There's a list. Their name's got to be on it in advance. You have to be a client already. Well, I'm here, and I think what I've been doing for the last hour qualifies me pretty bloody impressively as a client. Ask your hoor if you don't believe me. I believe you well enough, pal, but it's the morning night. I'm not sure I've got time to sort it, and the list might be full. Ah, room for a small one, though, right? You're not a small one, you fat bastard. Paddy laughed. Lively responded with a smile and a gentle fist to the upper arm. "You cheeky fucker!" And there was me thinking we could be mates. "Listen," Paddy whispered. "I'll try and get you on the list, but I won't know until tomorrow. Scalp's organising the whole thing himself. The address and time go out in a text. We only an hour to go, so no one gives it away. I can't guarantee anything." "Understood," Lively said. "And you can't tell anyone you gave me money." 
that had dropped me properly in the shit. I'll look after anyone who looks after me. Old school. Right, Paddy said. Give me your mobile number. He handed Lively a pen, and he scribbled the number onto an extra twenty-pound note, making sure Paddy saw there was plenty left where that came from. Watch your mobile, and be prepared to move quickly. Once the doors are locked, they don't open them for anyone. You're a pal, Lively said. Tomorrow, then. I'll see what I can do. Elenita watched Lively go through the tiniest crack between her door and its frame. He couldn't have looked less like a comic book superhero, yet the effect he'd had on her was no less than if Superman had flown in through her window, once he'd broken through the boarding, of course. She realised she was hungry. She hadn't felt properly starving like that in such a long time. The desire to eat, to make herself strong and healthy, had slowly dripped from her. Scalp hadn't yet chosen the women who would race tomorrow. The rest of the women didn't even have it on their radar, but then they hadn't seen Finley's video, and she hadn't had the heart to warn them. Why increase their fear when they were already living in terror? Release from captivity was only twenty-four hours away. All they had to do was survive until then. Close their eyes and imagine a better life while seeing to the clients. Eat a bit. Sleep for a while. Then it would all be over. The police would rescue them. She looked at her watch and began counting down not just the hours, but the minutes. Chapter 32 That's all the information I have. Time was limited and the guard was in the corridor, Lively explained. Where's Helen Uta from? Ava asked. Romania. I don't know about the other women there. Any word on Scalp's true identity? Eva asked the crowd gathered in the incident room. Nothing, ma'am, Graham replied. Plenty of people have heard of him, but no one knows his full name. I suspect he's come in recently from out of the area, so I've issued an alert requesting information across Police Scotland and also notified New Scotland Yard to spread the word and see if the other UK forces have any intelligence. Great. So do we have any idea where this race might be held? No rumours about that circulating? If anyone knows anything about it, they're not saying. And we can't ask too many questions in case the fact that we're asking gets back to scalp and he changes the venue or moves it back by a couple of days. We don't want him disappearing on us, Lively said. Ava looked at her watch. It was 3am. Since Lively had emerged from the flats four hours earlier, MIT had done nothing but get in touch with their usual sources and check databases, all to no effect. I'd say we just go in and get those women safe, Tripp said. Even 24 hours more of what they're living through might mean multiple additional rapes, not to mention violence and the threat of death. What if someone gets killed in there while we're making plans? Ava sympathised. That had been her initial view too. They'd solved two murders, even if no one was in cuffs yet although it was fair to say few were grieving over the loss of either Jean Oldman or Finlay Wilson. The three young women whose remains had been found at the pig farm deserved justice too. Their identities weren't yet known, but somewhere in the world they had family and friends waiting desperately to know what had happened to them. The best chance MIT had of arresting and convicting their killers and of identifying the dead woman would be at the race. Ava stood up. All right, she said. We can debate this all night. There's never going to be an answer that keeps everyone safe, but we'll do our best. I agree with D.S. Tripp that we have a serious responsibility to keep those women we already know about safe. There might be an awful lot of them in the flats at Wester Hales. And I get it. If any of those women get seriously hurt or, God forbid, killed before we start making arrests, it'll be on us. Me, in fact. While that's a risk I don't want to take, I can't see a way of avoiding it. The second we go in there, the whole network will close up. Every phone, every computer, every vehicle, every witness will disappear. Worst case scenario is that Scalp, whoever he is, hears about the first raid and decides to get rid of the other women who are too much of a liability. 
we might save some lives only to cause others to die. There was a general murmur of consent around the room. We've got a skeleton crew running surveillance at Wester Hales now. D.I. Graham, increase that, please. If any female comes out of those flats, on foot, unconscious, or in a body bag, I want undercover units tailing immediately. Everyone in plain clothes and concealed. Avoid contact with the locals. Not a single marked car. No sirens or lights, whatever happens. Use your discretion. But obviously, where there's an immediate threat to life, we'll have to intervene. Other than that, we watch and wait. Get perimeters established at all major junctions in the area. We're not expecting much movement until tomorrow evening. That's when it seems logical that they'll transport the chosen women to the race venue. What if none of the women from the Wester Hills flats is in the race? How will we know where it is then? Tripp asked. Some of Scalp's heavies from the flats will be going. Elanuta said they only leave one guard inside the flat on race night, Lively said. Sergeant Lively, we'll need you on the inside of the race from as early as possible, Eva instructed. I don't know if I'm even going to get on the list, ma'am, Lively said. We might just have to follow Scalp's men. Wait until everyone's inside and raid the place. Not good enough. If we don't have eyes inside, hearing and seeing what's going on, we don't have any evidence. Scalp could just say the women were taking part in a race and that there was no intent to harm them at the end, Eva said. But there's the last race. We can prosecute them for that, Tripp said. That was down to Finley Wilson, and he's dead. Ellen Uta says the recording on Wilson's laptop was destroyed by Scalp. Ellen Uta only saw it on video, and without a single witness there in person, and the victim's bodies largely destroyed, we won't get any murder convictions. You have to be inside, Sergeant. The whole case rests on you. No fucking pressure, then, Lively muttered. We'll follow Scalp's men. Make sure you're in the area. Even if you don't get the text, you'll have to pretend you did and blag your way in, Eva told him. It's not that easy. Security on this friggin' race is tighter than Sandringham on Christmas Day. Make it work, Eva snapped. If you don't, either more women will die or everyone inside walks free. We'll still have them on human trafficking and every assault charge you can imagine, DC Swift offered. Ava glared at him. Lively took over from her. Aye, that's great for us, doesn't compute Swift, but it won't be good enough for the parents of the girls who were killed for sport the last time. The Chief's right, failure's not a fucking option. Thanks, Sergeant, Ava said quietly. Right, let's get this plan clear. We need to hold on until everyone is inside before we raid. A build-up of police vehicles will alert them, so we have to be cautious until we've got every single one of them trapped like the rats they are. We'll be in contact with Lively inside. He'll send us a message when everything's about to start, and that's when we go. I'll need multiple paramedics on standby, but notify the receiving hospitals confidentially. Same goes for the fire service. Armed units are going in up front. We can be sure there'll be men in there with guns. This has to be a flawless operation. The second they realise what's happening, the first response will be to use any women inside as shields. Unbroken perimeter, no one gets away. Plenty of uniformed officers ready in the station to process everyone who gets arrested, and the number should be high. Briefings of the relevant units and teams all day. I'm calling in backup from the other Police Scotland areas. Lively? You'll have a concealed weapon, a mobile, and a hidden communications device. If they find a weapon on me, I'll be kicked straight back out, and that's best-case scenario. I could blow the whole thing if they suspect me. Then we're back to square one. All right. No weapon. But you have to be able to communicate with us. See what tech can do to make sure you get through without anything being picked up. The I. Graham, finding where the other women are across the city will be priority. Brief uniform teams on readiness to undertake further operations as soon as we start getting information from those arrested. I'll do deals with anyone who gives us useful information the second they have the opportunity. So DS Trip, make contact with the Procurator Fiscal this morning and have someone on standby at their office too. They need to know what we're doing anyway. They're about to get an awful lot of paperwork on their desks and we'll need some legal backup when we start breaking down doors. In terms of getting information from the women inside, we might need translators, ma'am, Lively said. 
Elanuta's English is workable but not fluent enough that she can give complex descriptions. I'm guessing it'll be the same for some of the others. Good point, Ava said. Also, we'll need somewhere safe to house any women we remove who don't require hospitalisation. They'll have to be seen by a doctor in any event. Clothes, food, beds for the night. It'll have to be somewhere secure, away both from the press and from anyone looking to help out Scalp. Contact Social Services Trip. See what they can do. Where will you be, ma'am? At the race, running point. I intend to go in with the armed units from the outset. Mum, Graham said. Too busy for any more discussions, she said. You've all got a week's work to fit into twelve hours. I'll buy all the coffee and biscuits. At lunchtime, I'll make sure you get as much fast food as you can eat. There are people depending on us, so no slip-ups. Thanks, everyone. She made her way out into the corridor. About halfway along, she realised no one was following her. No trip, with endless but always vital additional queries. No lively having to have the last word. No D.I. Graham asking if she was okay. It was too big a deal for that, she realised. She checked her watch and began making a mental to-do list. It was going to be the longest day imaginable. Chapter 33 by 10 a.m., Kalanak had slipped into two hours' sleep after a night of research and awoke into the sound of the email alert pinging on his mobile. He stretched and grabbed the phone. There was an update from social services saying that Azat and Husnia had successfully transferred to a family and were settling in. After that was an email from Jean-Paul. Daily phone calls to the hospital meant that Kalanak knew his friend's eyesight was recovering slowly that it still wasn't up to staring at a screen and writing emails. He'd obviously drafted in assistance from Interpol to help him get through the admin building up in his absence. Look, you have apparently decided against taking on a new partner while I'm temporarily out of action. That doesn't seem like a good choice, given the recent difficulties we found ourselves in. I can arrange either a replacement from Interpol for you, or pair you with an experienced officer from the local French police. Also, an update once in a while wouldn't be a bad thing. What the hell's going on? Jean-Paul. Kalanach grinned. Jean-Paul could never maintain formality from the start of an email to its end. He could see him as clearly as if he were in the hospital room, trying his best to maintain an air of professionalism while stuck in bed desperate to be up and involved. Kalanach began typing. Jean-Paul, many thanks for your email. I gave detailed consideration to requesting the assistance of a partner from either Interpol or the local police force, but decided, due to expediency, that it would be more efficient to proceed with the investigation alone. I'm aware that others continue to pursue strands of the investigation and will liaise with them as needed. Given that a second Scottish citizen is also now known to be on French soil, I believe it is crucial for me to take a lead in this case. I'm doing fine, by the way. No, I'm not taking any risks. No major shifts in the investigation. Now, let me get on with the job. Take the doctor's advice and get some rest. If anything comes up, you'll be the first to know. Look, he clicked send and opened the email he'd been saving until last. Luke, I'll be out of contact most of today. We have leads in two murder cases, which may also resolve three others. There will be a large-scale operation tonight in an attempt to detain multiple suspects at a single scene. If you need me urgently, please contact the incident room and they will do their best to pass a message along. As soon as this is completed, I'll be in touch for a full update on the Malcolm Riley and Bart Campbell cases, which I know is overdue. And I'm sorry to email this rather than phone. Yesterday, the doctors confirmed that they still weren't content with the extent of the surgery. Natasha is due to have a mastectomy in the next few days. We're just waiting for them to confirm the appointment. She doesn't want a lot of fuss. In spite of how brave she's been, this is hitting her hard. Don't race back. I'll let you know as soon as I have more info. Ava. Kalanak threw his mobile down on the bed. Fuck! 
he muttered, closing his eyes before drawing in a deep breath. His mobile offered another alert tone. He didn't want to look. Enough news for one day. What he needed to do was write to Natasha, but anything he came up with sounded trite in his own head, and that was before seeing it reduced to a font. Something was better than nothing, though. She needed to know he was thinking of her. He picked up his phone again, opening his email. The latest message sat in bold type, seemingly innocuous, its subject line proclaiming nothing other than the bland, Your Condition. He didn't recognize the sender's name. He took a screen grab, then opened the message. It was written in French and addressed to Monsieur Chevalte. He'd given a false email address to the clinic and had all messages diverted into his usual email. He took another screen grab of the complete email before beginning to read. Monsieur Chevalte, we are contacting you privately and confidentially to offer you a consultation regarding a possible treatment for your condition. Access to our treatments is extremely limited due to cost and practical considerations. You have been referred to us as an end-of-life case, and in those circumstances we are prepared to include you in our potential patients list. You will need to consent to engaging with us in absolute confidence. Big pharmaceutical corporations and governments conspire together to keep alternative treatments from the public, receiving billions of euros each year in covert payments for licensing only those drugs and treatments that serve them. We have consistently refused to engage in this corrupt process, and thus a license has been refused. If you cannot guarantee discretion, then we will have no choice but to remove your name from our list as you will jeopardize the opportunity for many others to receive potentially life-saving treatment at a time when their medical advisors have told them their situation is hopeless. Your invitation to receive further, more detailed information will expire within one hour. You can confirm your interest by replying to this email, upon which you will be given details for an in-person meeting with an access code and password. You alone will be allowed to attend that meeting. You must bring photographic ID and be prepared to be checked for recording devices. It was signed from Group 2029. No name. He messaged Interpol immediately, asking for a trace on the email, not that there would be a simple IP address that would lead them to the author. Whoever was organising international abductions of organ donors wasn't going to fail to protect themselves at the most basic communications level. He waited half an hour, made sure Interpol was watching and recording the email exchange, then replied, Dear Group 2029, I am interested in hearing more. My doctor has said there is no treatment available except a transplant, but my chances of getting a suitable liver in time are millions to one. I have a lot of questions. Do you have a website? What are your success rates? Would this be in France, or do I need to travel? Is there a phone number I could call, as I am anxious not to lose any more time? Yours, Luc Chevaute. They weren't going to answer any of his questions in an email, but a failure to ask them would raise an immediate red flag. Offer this sort of potential life-saving treatment to anyone who needed it, and they would inevitably come back asking for more information. It only took eight minutes for the response. Monsieur Chevalte, please attend at 167 Rue de Batelier, Clichy, apartment 206, this afternoon at 4 p.m. precisely. Attend alone. Identification and a body check will be required. You will have a 30-minute consultation session. Our representative will have information for you. He is not from Group 2029, but he will be able to pass any questions you have along to us after the consultation. There is no fee payable at this stage. If you attend with other people, you will not be allowed access. If it becomes clear that you have notified other people about our services, your consultation will be terminated to protect our other patients. You will not need a medical. 
we offer treatments that differ from normal medical procedures. If you do not attend this meeting, no further appointment will be offered and no further communications will be entered into. We look forward to meeting you and helping to reshape your future. Apartment access code 87961 Password Cathedral Group 2029 Kalanach checked the details for the apartment. It was a new build, and rooms were being offered for short-term business purposes, as well as for longer-term residential lettings. Payment would inevitably have been made in cash, or using an online payment facility that couldn't be traced back. Interpol would be attempting to identify the leasee already, but Kalanach wouldn't be holding his breath. If it were a hotel room, they might have some success persuading the management to allow them to place surveillance in a room. But the lease would have begun in the private building already, and at that stage they'd require a court order to force the building owner to comply. It could be done quickly, but not quickly enough if there was a lease in place and rights potentially being infringed. He emailed an update to Jean-Paul, copying both Ava and Interpol HQ. French police would detain whoever met him in person at the end of the meeting, and an order to examine their communications would be obtained within an hour of identifying them. What they actually needed, though, was evidence of where Bart Campbell was being held. That's if he was still alive. Chapter 34 It had been a relatively easy afternoon. Scalp had instructed that the flat doors be closed to clients, given the number of guards he had at the warehouse setting up. The new boss had been unusually jovial all day, parading around, barking instructions, reminding them time and time again that his first race was going to make everything that had gone before look like amateur night at the dog track. The comparison of the women to dogs wasn't wasted on Ellen Utah. Like so many greyhounds, the women were being kept for business purposes only, worked until they broke, then put down as soon as they weren't earning their keep anymore. Scalp had adopted an air of superiority that, almost impossibly, made him even more dislikable. One phone call after another had come through to his mobile. Guards had come and gone. Lockable cash boxes had been unwrapped from pristine cardboard. New SIM cards had been inserted into phones to be destroyed immediately after the race was over and Scalp himself had changed outfit three times, never quite satisfied that he was looking his absolute best for his crowning moment when he took the microphone. Elenuta had got through the previous night quietly after Lively had gone, desperate to tell the other women that their time left in captivity was on a countdown, but convinced she'd jinx it if she did. She'd slept wearing the jeans that contained Lively's knife, reaching down repeatedly to run her fingers along its outline in the hem, and fallen asleep clutching it, even though it meant having her leg bent up at an unnatural angle. She'd woken up stiff, her hip sore, and happier than she'd felt since the day she'd been forced into the back of a truck and driven across Europe. All she had to do now was wait it out. Just a few hours and the police would be there. Safety was waiting just outside the door. It was four in the afternoon when Scalp turned up with two new goons in tow. Elenuta kept to the back of the row of women when they were called out into the corridor, head down but listening carefully. Any additional information she could give the police when they turned up would help. She stole a quick glance at Scalp. He was paler than she remembered a sheen of sweat across his forehead, lighting him up beneath the bare bulb hanging from the ceiling. Right, I've got a special job on tonight, he said, and we need a couple of volunteers for it. Elenuta's stomach shriveled. She'd known this was a possibility, but hoped the women who'd be racing had already been selected from the other flats. Not that it made it any better for those women, just that she wouldn't have to live with the knowledge that she'd kept information from her flatmates that could have helped them avoid this situation. So, who hasn't been pulling their weight? He asked their regular guard. Only this would be an opportunity for them to get back in my good books. None of the women spoke. 
They might not have known what was going on, but they'd all long since stopped trusting anything they were told. Her. The guard pointed at one of the oldest women in the group, Suzanne, who rarely got chosen unless all the other girls were busy. Or her. He poked Annika in the shoulder. At just sixteen, Annika might have been a favourite with the regulars if she took better care of herself. But lately, Elenita had noticed the girl pulling out patches of her hair and eyelashes. She'd lost so much weight that every rib showed as clearly as on an X-ray, and her eyes appeared over-large. The effect was ghoulish and off-putting. All right, Scalp said. You can both come. If you're good, you'll get a prize. Susan looked shocked and terrified, while Annika began to smile. Elenuta wanted to slap some reality into her. What prize? Annika asked, stepping forward towards Scalp. Elenuta saw heroine's delusion in her eyes and realised she'd been using far more than the other women to cope with the day-to-day -day existence. Annika wouldn't stand a chance in the race. She was just as likely to sit on the floor and wait for death as she was to run and fight. If the police didn't intervene in time, whatever their plan was, Annika was almost certainly going to be the first to die. The only place she could possibly survive was in the flat with the other women to protect her. All Elenuta had wanted was to keep quiet, stay put, and wait. The day's hours had slipped away, and now the end was in sight. She believed that Sergeant Lively or someone under his command would come to the flat. Any guards that remained would be arrested. Scalp would be far away at whatever venue he'd chosen for the race, and the police would be there too, ready to stop that bloodbath before any more women lost their lives. That was why she'd waited all day, so the police had a chance to figure out everything about the race. Only nothing in life was certain. She had learned that lesson the hard way when she was abducted. It was possible that the police would be a split second too late. Scalp might change the format for the race and start it early, or, God forbid, decide to sacrifice some poor woman at the very start to prove, mainly to himself, how incredibly powerful he was. Or it might all be fine. It would have to be, she told herself. She wasn't going to die today. But she couldn't let someone as young and vulnerable as Annika die either. Fuck, she muttered to herself. Not my problem. But her conscience objected immediately. Reluctant hero or not, Elenuta knew it wasn't even a choice. The police would save them all she persuaded herself, because they had to. It was that, or execution. She'd thought this would be the last time she'd have to look at Scalp's face, unless it was from a witness box in a courtroom, with police and prison officers there to protect her. She welcomed the chance to look into his eyes under those circumstances. But she couldn't send a child to her death. Much as she hated to, she stepped forward. I want a chance, Ellen Newton said. I want to win prize. She raised her eyebrows and stared at Scalp. You can get back to work, Scalp said. I've got what I wanted. I ran away again. I did before. Well, that was you, was it? Lucky for you, you've a half-decent fucking face. You're a money earner. If no prize, I kill next client. Police will come look. Are you fucking threatening me? Scalp stepped towards her, pushing the still grinning Annika out of the way. She stumbled into the wall as Scalp grabbed a handful of Elenuta's hair and twisted her neck upwards. I want prize, she repeated. That's because you don't know what the prize is, he snarled in her face. And she resisted the temptation to headbutt him. Scalp wasn't above strangling a woman to death out of sheer anger, even if it made no commercial sense. I have first go. Annika is only sixteen. She try next time. She's young, 
The crowd will like it. Plus, she's useless here. I've made my decision. Get back in your room. He released her, letting her fall into the doorway. Elenuta got upright again and walked after him. I see film of race. I know what is. I escape and tell police. She held his gaze, watching his frown turn into something closer to hatred. You'll die, he said. Is that what you want? Elenuta held her tongue. Because if that's it, I can help you with that right here, right now. Shall I? He bent down to look her straight in the eyes. His breath stank of stale cigarette smoke, and just below his nose were telltale grains of white powder. She counted down from ten, rigid, waiting for his decision. All right, you fucking bitch. You want to race? You can. I don't ever want to see your face again, so I might as well make some money out of it. The kid can take the next turn. And now we're fucking late, that's just great. Get these two in the car, he told the man next to him. The rest of you get cleaned up, the bloody stinks in here. He kicked a bin as he walked past, head held high, king of his castle. One of the men took Elenita by the arm, pulling her towards the door. Wait, call her, she remembered. Scalp took a knife from his pocket and cut through it. You won't be needing it again, anyway, he told Elenita, as he did the same with Susan's collar. Maybe I win, Elenita said quietly. A few wins, sweetheart. I'm going to celebrate by wringing your fucking neck myself. How's that for an evening to look forward to? Scalp shoved her and Susan across the threshold. Elenita took a last look at the row of women staring in horror as she left. The police were nowhere to be seen as they exited the building. Either the operation had gone terribly wrong, or they were doing their job exceptionally well. She was betting on the latter with her life. Chapter 35 Rue de Batelier was out of Paris's centre, an innocuous enough road, with the Grand Parc des Docks de Saint-Ouen on one side and semi-high-rise flats in different stages of construction along the other. It hardly seemed the place you'd go to buy a new organ from a kidnap victim. But then, Kalanak wondered, where was? Officers were stationed outside the building to provide backup, but none were inside. It was too much of a risk. The apartment had been rented for the previous two weeks and it was safe to assume Group 2029 had security arrangements in place which included monitoring people entering and exiting. A sudden influx of people would immediately arouse suspicion. He repeated the routine, yellowing his eyes and preparing himself for likely questions. Group 2029 had paid the rent in cash, together with a deposit that limited the amount of questions asked by the landlord. There were no company records available for them, and no intelligence about them. It seemed likely that the name changed on each email. Kalanach punched the entry code into the panel outside the apartment door and entered. The man standing inside the door was all brawn. Six foot four, with tattoos peeking out of the top of his shirt and below his cuffs. He could have been a doorman at any club in the city, your name, please, he asked, in an accent a long way from Paris chic. Luc Chivote, Kalanach replied, making sure his hand had a just noticeable tremor to it as he held out his fake driver's license. The password. Is this all really necessary? I'm just here to get more information. The password has to be given before you can go through, the doorman said. Blankly. Okay, sure. Cathedral. I wasn't sure what to expect. Will there be a presentation, or... I have to check you. He was polite, but obviously not prepared to answer any questions. Kalanach put his arms up slowly, 
giving a faint groan as he did so, conscious of possible hidden cameras and who might be watching. The security officer ran an airport-style electrical monitor over his body, pointing at pockets which elicited a beep. Leave your mobile in the box. Um, I don't really like to leave it anywhere I can't see it, for privacy reasons. Do you think you could make an exception? Kalanach asked, knowing the answer, but the pretense was necessary. You'll get it back afterwards, was all the response he got. He left his mobile in the security officer's keeping and was shown through to another room. Taking the chair on the side of the desk that didn't have a file, Kalanach stared out of the window and waited. The whole place was bland, anonymous. It was clever. Use an apartment for a couple of weeks, then move on. Presumably not just up a floor or across a street, but to a different area of the city altogether. An internal door opened and a man walked in, serene smile fixed in place. Suited and tied, hair neat, hand ready for shaking. Kalanach made a show of effort in standing up, gripping the offered hand only weakly, breathing hard. Monsieur Chevrotet, the man began, I'm here representing Group 2029. We're so pleased you decided to find out more. Please sit down, take all the time you need. Would you like a bottle of water? Thank you, Kalanach said. The man made his way to a mini-fridge. Cheap, temporary, portable. Kalanach opened the offered water and took a long drink as he studied the man in front of him. He hadn't noticed him at the clinic, but then he'd have been easy to miss. Early to mid-thirties, clean-cut, nothing remarkable. Unathletic, erring on the too skinny side of thin eyes that didn't want to settle anywhere. So, let's begin, the man said, taking his seat behind the desk and opening the file. First of all, I have to cover the issue of confidentiality. He picked up a pen and ran its nib along the text as he read. The treatment we offer is not one you will find in any traditional hospital or practice. It has been developed... Sorry, Kalanak interrupted. I didn't catch your name. Are you a doctor? Um, no, I'm a... The man's eyes flicked to the top of the page he was reading from. A client liaison executive. And your name is... We don't give out our names at this stage. As I was explaining, the confidentiality issue... I understand. It's just that I was hoping for a more personal approach. I've had so many different doctors... It can be difficult to trust when there's no connection, Kalanak explained. The man coughed into his hand. I wonder if I could just read this? There's a section at the end for questions. I think when you hear all the information, you'll feel much better about it. Oh, sure, I get it. Go ahead. Thank you. Right. Our need for confidentiality relates to threats received from large pharmaceutical companies who have rejected our calls to understand the value, validity, and nature of our treatments. The corruption of these big corporations and the extent of their reach into the political sphere, including the police force, means that it is unsafe for us to reveal too much about our company, our practitioners, and researchers. Their refusal to recognize our treatments means that we have not been able to roll them out wide-scale, but we continue our work to help the few because a single life saved is worth our time. Big pharmaceuticals receive billions each year in grants, in drug sales, and even more in fundraising. They refuse to open up the marketplace to newer, more innovative treatments because of the financial risk to them. How exactly does the treatment... The man held up a hand to stop him. Sorry. Because of the extreme danger to our staff and our practice through breach of confidentiality and sharing of information, we ask you to pay the fees for treatment up front. The fee structure is in thirds. Two-thirds of it remains with our company, 
And the final third is a returnable deposit repayable to you once your treatment is complete and when we are certain that you have not breached the confidentiality contract. It will be repaid to you no more than 72 hours after treatment. You've been assessed as suitable for our treatment given the lack of probability of traditional successful ongoing treatment or transplant taking into account your age and previous record of good health. The cost of treatment and payment facility will be notified to you by email at the end of this meeting. We recognize that our charges are high, but that's because we have to recompense the family who will contribute to your future well-being. Kalanach watched him reading. His expression was almost blank. Whatever role he had in the company, he was either in the dark about the details or he had the best poker face imaginable. The treatment itself consists of specific and targeted living cell transfer. Stem cells have been used in treatments for many years now, but that is dependent on having access to the right cells. Our innovative new treatment identifies living donors without the risks involved in transplants and organ rejection, without the need for donor-to-recipient matching, and with a full, consensual and compensatory practice that fulfills our legal and moral obligations to all involved. Living donors? Kalanach asked. I'm just getting to that bit. Our donors are all in vegetative states, but prior to reaching that state, they all signed and agreed to take part in this program. We have identified a donor who would meet your needs in terms of the age and health of their organs. None of the donors have organ damage that relates to the organ whose cells you require. We are able to provide you with medical assessments, photographs and evidence of the donor's desire to help others live on after their death. But why would they? We have limited scope to discuss an individual donor's decision-making processes, as you'll understand. This is a personal decision they reach with their families. Some have received spinal injuries, for example, and are seeking end-of-life treatment, but wish to help others before they die. Some might have the onset of a genetic disease, which you will not be affected by. Where do these donors come from? Are they all French or... This time the man didn't bother with a hand. He just continued speaking. Healthy cells can be introduced orally into your body. Eating raw is a cornerstone of all good cancer advice. This is because the raw consumption of all cells... Kalanach's stomach hit a zero gravity moment. He frowned, blinked realizing the man had paused and was waiting for him to compose himself. I'll wait, he said. This is revolutionary science. It's important you understand how it works. But his eyes were still on the page. Even this pause, this reassurance, was scripted. I'm fine, Kalanak said. You can keep reading. The raw consumption of cells is the purest, cleanest way to reinvigorate the body. Contrary to popular belief, not all cells are completely broken down in the digestive process. With treatment and coating from our newly developed and proven formula, those cells can be absorbed into the body with their individual organ benefits intact, with medical properties that the body can recognize and incorporate into the body's own failing organ to begin the regenerative process. Our success rate with the treatment is more than 50%, which in chronic or late-stage cases marks a dramatic breakthrough in life-saving procedures. Again, we stress that everything we do is consensual. If you decide to proceed with the treatment, your donor's family will be provided with your generic details, no name, so that they can treasure the knowledge of the life their loved one has helped save. Here are testimonies. He handed over a sheaf of papers from people we have already successfully treated. At this stage, I'm able to offer you some details of your potential donor. Would you like that? Yes, please. The man handed over more pages of A4 that Kalanach scanned for logos. Not a leaf in sight. 
It was starting to look as if whatever Azat had seen on the van had no relevance at all to Group 2029's organisation. On the first page were several photos of an adult female, Caucasian, face slightly blurred. We've blurred her facial features to protect her anonymity. Some donors consent to all their details being known and others opt for a level of privacy. Her medical records are on the following pages, again with redactions. Kalanach glanced through the photos. Some were obviously taken before the so-called donor was bedridden, standing up, showing a healthy body, good muscle tone. In the next, she was in a hospital bed, hooked up to a variety of machines and monitors. The last photos are a little distressing, I'm afraid, but the point is that we are very careful to prove that the patient has reached the point of unresponsiveness. The photos were a wide shot of a doctor, face obscured by a mask, putting something into the patient's thigh. The close-up showed that it was a needle, a substantial distance into the flesh, certainly far enough that a normally responsive individual would be unable to remain still. That's very reassuring, Kalanach managed. He turned the page. A variety of convincing details were listed, from childhood immunizations to an adult diagnosis of cervical cancer. You'll see that this cervical cancer has been assessed as non-threatening to you, but the donor's age, race, and other fitness make her cells the perfect gift for your future well-being. We cannot allow you to take these documents away, but you would see the donor immediately prior to her life support being switched off, so you'll be able to confirm that she matches the details given here. Immediately before she passes, donors are kept in peace and comfort, ensuring end of life takes place in controlled circumstances at the optimum moment for transfer of cells and to add our life-prolonging formula before it's administered to you in our laboratory environment. You can now ask questions and I will provide answers as far as possible. Okay. Well, that's obviously a lot of information. Um, is this legal? Sorry if that sounds rude, but, you know, it's something I haven't heard of before. The man scanned the page. All treatments are legally compliant in the same way any organ donation where consent is freely given is lawful. Donors are being kept alive by machines only. No life is terminated without the family's express consent, and terminations only take place once life would not be sustainable without artificial, medical, and mechanical assistance. One third of the money you pay goes to the family or assignee of the donor to help them in their grief. You will receive a copy of the legal donor agreement, contract, and consent form as a donation ceremony. Donation ceremony? The donation ceremony takes place on short notice due to the nature of the donor's illness. Cells need to be transferred quickly, but no life may be shortened artificially to ensure that we at no stage breach medical oaths. You will be sent a message giving you an address, then taken via company transport to our facility. The ceremony involves a purification ritual, which is important to the donor and their families, a blessing, and a period of gratitude and reflection before organs are transferred. The donor's family or friends may also be present, but in a separate room so as to respect their grief at such a delicate time. Sometimes they request a meeting with the donor, which we urge you to accept. That's really amazing, Kalanak said. I think I'd like that. And as to the science, our formula is designed to maximize cellular transfer benefits, to minimize intrapatient infection, and to bolster the strength of the cells as they meet your own body's organ. Our formula is combined with antibiotics and a steroidal treatment to ensure efficiency. And by consume, you mean what exactly? The man took a breath and continued reading. The cells and medical formula are provided to you orally. You will see the organ prior to its preparation to prove its fitness, 
The organ will then be taken to our laboratory for preparation and returned to you for consumption with medical oversight. I eat it. Oral consumption, the man repeated. Kalanach fought the desire to grab him by the throat. What if it goes wrong? Where do I go? Do I get my money back? All medical treatment for chronic or late-stage illness is unpredictable. Our success rate is better than any other treatment offer you may receive. Our treatments have been tested in line with current regulations over a number of years. The treatment itself may carry side effects of nausea, and you will be given an injection to help prevent this. Other side effects may include stomach cramps, diarrhea, and headaches. A full list will be provided to you. You will need to sign a liability waiver, as is standard in all hospitals. You'll be given a 24-hour emergency phone number for the first seven days after treatment, and a doctor's appointment will be sent to you roughly two weeks after treatment for a checkup. Why can't I just drive myself to the facility? Corporate spies are a constant threat to our life-saving work. Information sharing, even inadvertently, can threaten our ability to work with you and for you. Our arrangements are made to ensure both your safety and our ongoing mission to fight otherwise incurable diseases. He scanned the page. Our session has now come to an end. You will be emailed further instructions within the hour. How soon can I have the treatment? Kalanak persisted. Oh yes, I can answer that one. Treatment can be assumed to be within the next 48 hours, subject to payment being made. 48 hours? That's... Wow! The man stood up and held out his hand to shake Kalanax. It was cold, slightly damp. Thank you so much, Kalanax said. I feel like I've been given a chance. I hope I didn't keep you too long. That's all right. I've finished for today, the man replied giving the first genuine smile since Kalanach had entered. He looked relieved it was over. That was good. It made what they needed to do now so much easier. Will I see you again? Kalanach asked. No, I'm only involved at the front end, so to speak. I hope it goes well for you, and I'm, you know, really sorry for what's wrong with you. He sounded vague and embarrassed. Kalanach gave a nod to the doorman as he reclaimed his mobile and left. He made sure he was clear of any prying ears or eyes, taking the stairs and exiting onto the street. Georgia Moretti Russo, queen of her cell in Europe's most notorious prison, had been right about the organ transplant. It hadn't been what they were expecting. Preying on the vulnerable, the terminally ill, taking advantage of people staring down the barrel of a premature death. All of that had become increasingly obvious. But unwitting cannibalism of a murder victim, paid for at vast expense, that was something he'd never imagined he might encounter. He took a deep breath and got on his phone. I'm out, he told the police unit leader outside the doors. Two men will follow. One's a security guard, looks more like a bouncer, Caucasian, Early forties, shaved head, six foot four, wearing a suit, but with visible tattoos on his neck and hands. Extremely heavy set. Follow, but do not detain. We want him acting normally. Keep eyes on him twenty four hours a day until we make other arrests. But get access to his communications and bank account to see if there's relevant traceable activity. The other male, also Caucasian, is thirty to thirty-five years old, short brown hair, slim, no noticeable tattoos, five-eight, brown eyes, clean-shaven, and wearing a tan suit with a dark blue tie. I want him picked up as soon as you've established that he's definitely not being watched or followed by anyone else. Keep the pickup away from this building in case other flats are occupied by the same company. Take his communication devices and let me know what you find. Immediate interview, and tell him it's in his interests to cooperate. Try to persuade him not to lawyer up. 
and log his phone call to his lawyer. I don't want information passed through the legal team. Kalana hung up. He went to dial Ava's number before remembering she was on an operation, and called the incident room instead. This is Kalanach. Notify DCI Turner as soon as she's available that there is a third victim in the Markham Riley case. Currently kidnapped, but believed still alive. Female, Caucasian, late teens to early twenties between 5'6 and 5'10, blonde hair, eye color unclear, slim build. I'm working on the assumption that she might also be Scottish. Please check missing persons files or crime reports ASAP and come back to me. We need to establish an identity. He rang off. A door slammed around the corner and footsteps headed for the stairs. This was their best chance at finding Bart Campbell and hopefully also saving the life of the young woman who was in the process of having her liver sold to him. Quite possibly their only chance. Chapter 36 The warehouse looked innocuous enough. It had taken a mammoth feat of organisation to locate it. Visitors had come and gone from the flats in Wester Hales all day, and on each occasion a different, unmarked, suitably banged-up-looking police vehicle had to tail the leads. MIT had used up almost every undercover vehicle at their disposal, including motorbikes, vans, and an old minibus, too wary of the network of Scalp's men communicating to drive the same one twice. Three journeys ended up at random houses. Twice the destination was a shopping centre. One was a trip to fill up with petrol and return to Wester Hills. Difficult not to get spotted following a car to a petrol station and back again. But finally, some of Scalp's muscle men had set off out of Edinburgh mid-afternoon and led them to the right place just as Ava was starting to give up hope. Since then, they'd been tentatively moving officers into the area. A few were having a meal at a local pub, and watching the road outside. Others were just driving around the area. Most were stuck, freezing, in the fields and woodlands surrounding the warehouse. Ava disliked the distance the warehouse was from any other buildings, and the fact that all the external lights had been deliberately disengaged. Someone had been more than just diligent in researching the perfect location. It was within easy reach of the city's outer limits, but without the need to drive directly through the area's small villages and arouse suspicion. Set in a former industrial area that had fallen into disuse when a motor parts manufacturer had decided that Southeast Asia was a cheaper bet, the building was currently unoccupied. The fact that the car park tarmac was strewn with chunks of rock, pushed up by insistent weeds, indicated that no one had been in occupation for a very long time. Given that research had been time-limited to just that afternoon, MIT had no idea of the internal layout of the building. Not that the original blueprints would necessarily have borne any resemblance to its current layout. The rural location also ensured that it was practically impossible for Police Scotland to get many vehicles into the area without making their presence known. Later on in the evening, when the car park was starting to fill up, that would be an option, but for now they'd only chance to pass with a couple of vehicles sufficiently muddied up to appear farmer-owned. Ava herself was in army camouflage fatigues and lying on her belly in icy dirt under the hedge of a neighbouring field watching the main entrance through binoculars. The problem with the nature of the building was that it would have been easy for the fire exits to have been jammed shut and probably also barricaded from the inside. She had teams in place to try those exits, but she wasn't holding out much hope. The main entrance was a set of metal double doors, no window glass, and there were already two men outside those with bulky enough jackets that they could be concealing anything underneath. It was no amateur operation, and she was about to send in D.S. Lively alone, without a weapon. Eva offered up a silent prayer to the gods of chaos, asking them politely to take the evening off, and crawled back out of her hiding hole, running under cover to the unmarked car parked at the end of a nearby field where Lively and Trip were hunkered down. Tell me you've had a message, Eva demanded. Fuck all. Lively said, staring at his mobile. 
It's working, right? You've got a signal. She peered over his shoulder. Been checking it every five minutes, Trip told her. All the messages from my phone have come straight in. Damn it. Is the coffee still hot? Lively poured her a cup from a flask, and she wrapped her hands around it, opening up a laptop and staring at the screen that showed her where her units were positioned in the vicinity. Are you absolutely sure Paddy didn't tell you what time to expect the message? Mum, he said he was going to try and sort it, but that he couldn't promise anything. Depends on the list and on scalp. It doesn't matter how many times you ask me the same question, the answer won't change. We've got to get you in there one way or another, and it's getting pretty bloody late. Trip, do we have eyes on scalp? Yes, ma'am, and a reasonable photo of his face, but no identification as yet. He's about five minutes away. DC Monroe is in the car behind him and updating us in real time. Looks as if there's a bit of a convoy. At least three vehicles left Wester Hills at the same time. Two cars and a van exiting from different roads. But they've followed the same route since then, headed in this direction. They won't keep the doors open for a minute longer than is necessary once everyone's here. Lively, how did the communications testing go? Wasn't bad. Uncomfortable, but you'll be able to hear my voice. And I'm not sure why the best option was to make the earpiece look like a hearing aid. I'll take my mobile in too, but I'm guessing that'll be taken off me like it was at the flat yesterday. And all units are clear on the signal for police entry? Eva asked Tripp. Yes, ma'am. Sergeant Lively will say, epic. We figured it was unique enough that we'd definitely hear it, and that it would make sense in the context of what they're expecting other men's reactions to be. Is that all right? Is it all right that women are going to be racing for their lives, while an audience waits to watch them get killed? And the expected reaction is epic. No, Trip, it's really fucking not. That's not exactly what I meant. I know it wasn't. She sighed. I'm sorry. It'll work fine, Trip. It has to. Any word on the women yet? Surveillance didn't get a good look, but the assumption is that the women are en route in the van rather than the cars to keep them hidden from view. Right. I'm going back out then. How far away are our armed units? Spread out at various extended perimeters. Paramedics are in the nearest village and we have fire crew on standby. Do you think we have enough backup, ma'am? Only, there are going to be a lot of people inside that building. There'll be gunfire. Scalp's men won't give in without a fight. Touch some wood, Sergeant Tripp. I'm not delivering any of my team to a hospital today. And Lively, do whatever it takes to get your ass inside that building. We need eyes inside to lock these bastards up forever. Just don't get yourself killed. Ava hopped back out of the vehicle and returned to her earlier position khaki hood up over her hair, settling in as comfortably as she could, knowing it would likely be an hour until she could move a muscle. The first car drove into the parking area just as she was established in her ditch and newly covered with leaves. Four men disembarked, none of them the sort she'd want to share a dark alley with late at night. They laughed and joked, entirely at ease. No indication that they'd realised the police operation was on their horizon. That was a start. They greeted the men guarding the doors with shoulder punches and expletives, delivered with a side order of stupid grins. Ava grimaced. She didn't want them to be a team. She had specifically hoped they wouldn't be friends. Friends looked out for one another and fought back. They didn't run at the first sign of trouble or turn on each other at the blink of an indictment. The bouncer turned and knocked the door hard in a rhythm Ava couldn't make out from a distance. The use of a code was basic, but efficient. It was open from the inside. No key entry from the exterior, then. They'd been too careful for that. The four newcomers disappeared inside, and the door swung heavily and loudly shut behind them, proclaiming its impenetrability. The next car that pulled in was a Range Rover, a thug climbed out of the driving seat. Much as Ava tried not to judge by appearance, on this occasion she decided to let her prejudices rule her political correctness. He was huge, shaven-headed, with a beard making up for the upper hair loss, gut spilling over the top of his black jeans, armless T-shirt in spite of the cold and encroaching evening. 
tattoos down his arm, an actual list of previous convictions. Her binoculars told her he was claiming everything from robbery to bestiality. She'd seen her fair share of tattoos, but no one yet had had the audacity to set out his prior convictions in permanent ink. Then the passenger door opened, and out crawled a completely different shade of evil. Ava studied the man, checked her reaction to him, and looked again. There was nothing overtly visual that made her react so strongly to him. He was just a man. But that face, the sheer force of the hatred and the utter coldness of his expression, made her bed of early spring mud seem like a hot tub in comparison. Scalp. She didn't need to know his real-world identity. He was made up of so many other men she'd met in her years as a police officer. He believed other people, women in particular, were dispensable. He believed he was destined for something bigger and better. He was dangerous because he liked cruelty. She checked the weapon in its holster, pressing with painful reassurance into her ribcage. She and Scalp wouldn't get on, and she had to make sure that her every action was born of necessity and procedure, not simply to rid the world of a man who seemed to walk in his own special patch of shadow. The van that pulled in right next to the doors diverted her attention. Scalp slapped one of the doormen on the back and said something that made the guard laugh way more than anyone naturally would. A desire to impress, combined with a nasty case of being terrified, would do that. The van's rear doors were pulled open and two women climbed out, another male bringing up the rear. Ava saw no more than thirty seconds of the women, but that was enough. The first was older, walking with a stoop. She allowed herself to be helped into the building. The woman who followed behind pulled her arm away from the man who tried to guide her. Her head was up, eyes watchful and alert. Dark-haired, brown eyes, beautiful, with a jaw set that marked her resistance, Ava knew this was the Elenuta that Lively had described in so much detail in his initial report. Her view was obscured when a second van pulled in. Two more women disembarked. One carried over a man's shoulder, the other dragged. Ava fed descriptions through her earpiece back to Trip as the unloading of the vans continued. Lights were brought in, laptops, other miscellaneous computer equipment, and drones. If she'd stumbled across the activity by chance, Ava could easily have mistaken it for a reality TV set rather than the location of the world's nastiest spectator sport. The setup was completed twenty minutes later. The girls were there, the kit was in situ, and there was a multitude of muscle both inside and out. Ava shoved her gloved hands into her armpits to warm them up, and waited. It was 6.30pm, and other cars were starting to arrive. Has Lively heard from Paddy yet? Ava whispered to Tripp through her headset. She heard Lively cursing in the background and knew the answer. Never mind, she said. They're obviously gearing up to get started, and the car park's filling up fast. Fifteen minutes from now we try to get Lively in there, whether his name's on the list or not. You'll have to blag it. Make sure he's ready. By 6.45pm, Lively had a pocket full of used twenties. A hearing aid that he hoped like hell he'd never need in real life, given the headache it was causing him, and the unshakable feeling that something was really, really wrong. He'd been brought a car that he'd driven the three short lanes to the warehouse car park, guided by instructions from Trip that were echoing feedback, to be met with a queue of vehicles that didn't understand the concept of orderly parking. Still no text message, which meant he had to explain how the hell he'd found the venue before he could even start worrying about how he was going to get inside. What he hadn't been prepared for was the scale of what he was about to walk into. Warehouse, sure, it was going to be a big place. Out of town, made sense. But there were easily more than a hundred cars parked. Assuming they weren't all single occupancy, that meant an operation that was more an out-and-out -out battle than a raid. In his earlier years, he'd worked on the inside of football's seedier side, organised fights after the game. Gang-style crime within supporters' clubs, 
extending to drug dealing and retaliatory violence. He'd marveled at the scale of that, but this was something else. And on top of all that, he was winging it. Taking his time, tagging onto the end of a group of three other men, he walked towards the warehouse door, listening carefully to the men ahead of him. Names? the security guard demanded. Sam Wishaw. Jerry Blake. Barney Wheeler, the last one mumbled. We're on the list. The guard ran his pen down a clipboard, ticking the names off. Money. He held out his hand. Wishaw handed over a bundle. Blake counted his out in tens. And Wheeler went last, crumpled five-pound note after sticky note. Most of it in a ball the guard had to flatten out, paying the last few pounds in coins. The guard gave him a look of disgust, but waved the three in. Lively took one final look at his mobile. Still nothing. If there were armed units hiding in the tree line at the end of the car park, he couldn't see them. Wing into prayer time. Name? Jackie Thompson. The guard checked the list once, twice, then gave Lively a look that most men would take as a cue to run. Ah, oh, fuck me, is it not on there? That's typical, that is. It's Paddy around. He can sort this out. He's a bit busy right now, pal, the guard said. Your name's not on the list, which means you got no fucking business being here. But keep your hair on. It's a fuck-up for me, too. Paddy was going to get my name on the list. You'll get it sorted. Could you not just give him a shout so I can have a chat with him? The guard stared at him, slipping a hand into his pocket his fingers bulging around a shape of some sort. Lively didn't want to think too hard about what sort of weapon he was holding. I'll call Paddy. Then you got sixty seconds to get this straightened out. Don't you friggin' move a step. He hammered the door in a rapid sequence, and it opened from the inside. Get Paddy out here now. Or some bloke thinks his name should be on the list. If Paddy doesn't vouch for him, I'm going to have to tell the boss. An impatient groan from beyond the door, then footsteps walking away. Lively waited a couple of minutes before the door opened again and Paddy's face appeared. Thunderous didn't do it justice. What the fuck? he demanded before Lively could greet him. Aye, aye, I know. Lively put his hands in the air. Let me just explain. Paddy took him by the arm and pulled him thirty metres away behind the first row of parked cars. You want to explain to me how I'm seeing your fucking face when I didn't text you the details? Just a misunderstanding. Lively smiled. Honesty God, give me a minute. There was a gun in Paddy's hand that Lively hadn't seen coming. I don't like this. You're fucking up to something. Paddy was keeping his voice low, and Lively realised he could make that work. Paddy was just as scared of anyone finding out that he might have fucked up as he was angry at Lively for turning up without an invitation. Listen, I followed Barney Wheeler here. Fat fuck was in our local pub a couple of hours ago. I was in there, waiting to get the text from you. I recognised him coming out of the flats last night, same time as me. Must have been visiting the hoors on a different floor, I guess. I knew he was a client, so when I saw him in the pub, I listened in on his conversation. He was showing off about how he was going to fuck you all over with some funny money. Said he'd got hold of a load of counterfeit fivers. Good artwork, he reckoned, but the texture's a bit crap, so he was planning to mess them all up before he handed them over. Go ask your man over there if you don't believe me. Anyway, I was so sure I'd get the message from you about tonight that I decided to follow him and make sure I was in the vicinity. I know I shouldn't have done, but stay there. Don't say a bloody word till I get back, Paddy said. He walked back to the doorman, had a few words, then they began inspecting the mass of screwed-up five-pound notes Barney Wheeler had handed over. Paddy returned. You still shouldn't have come. Scalp said no late additions to the list. I get it. Bad decision on my part. I'll go. At least you can give that wee wanker Wheeler what he deserves. Aye, the boss won't like it if he's been given dodgy notes. All right. Well, maybe that'll make up for me fucking up. 
You're a busy man. I'll be off. Paddy sighed. You got the cash on you? He asked quietly. Yeah. What's due on the door and what I said I'd give as a thank you? Man of my word. Ah, fuck. Come on. I never liked that little cunt wheeler. Now you're here, you might as well come in. Boss won't like it if anyone leaves the area before it's all over anyway. Not a friggin' word to anyone else, though. Lively slid his hand in his right pocket and drew out the cash, holding Paddy's share of it low enough that no one else was going to see the transaction. Paddy snatched it away, shoving it into his pocket and motioning for Lively to get moving. I owe you one, Lively said quietly. Just keep your head down in there. Tonight's supposed to run like clockwork, so no mere surprises, right? Quiet as a mouse. Lively clapped him on the back. You won't even know I'm there. I better not. They walked to the door together, 